Hello, everybody. We are live here for the Deadly Analysis podcast. Uh, I'm going to be your host this evening. Uh, my name is Garrett Merriam. Uh, I am a regular here on the Deadly Analysis podcast, but some of you might not know, I actually am also an assistant professor of philosophy at uh, California State University, Sacramento. Um, and uh, I have a, uh, a little, little presentation here, which uh, uh, my, my fellow panelists and I are going to, going to talk about the relationship between philosophy and horror. Uh, while obviously the deadly analysis is typically about uh, a horror films, uh, that, and that is going to be a central focus, I'm going to talk also a little bit about some, some horror fiction of the written variety uh, um, and also some, some fine art as well. So without further ado, I want to sort of start to sort of wade into the, the relationship between philosophy and horror. So um, the there's a whole host of interesting uh, philosophical questions that are, arise at the intersection of philosophy and horror. Um, so so uh, th there's a lot that we could I could talk about, but I wanted to keep it sort of manageable here for a first time out. Um, and I want to sort of just sort of skim the surface of a host of these questions. If uh, this is a success, if people seem to like it, we might want to come back and sort of explore some of these individual topics in more depth or also add some other topics onto the list. Uh, but for now, uh, this evening, what we plan to talk about is start first off, I want to ask questions about why it is that we enjoy horror. What is it about uh, going to a place uh, or, or and, and it deliberately try to put ourselves in a position where we experience an emotion which many people typically feel considered to be unpleasant and uncomfortable? Why is it that people actually pay for the privilege of doing this? Um, and then I also want to ask about what's the relationship between uh, sort of the, the horror films and the horror fiction that a society produces and that society? How is, how is in what ways, horror reflecting on uh, social problems uh, within a society and trying to sort of address things in an artistic and indirect fashion? Um, I also want to ask a question about the relationship between horror and human nature. What is it that, that horror tells us about who we are in sort of a deep and fundamental sense and the things that we really care about, we really value, and of course the things that we truly fear the most. Um, I also want to look at an age-old question about the relationship between horror and sex, and we'll give some sort of examples of the different ways in which these things can intersect. Um, and I also sort of want to close more, uh, by asking about sort of the aesthetics of horror. How is it and in what ways can sort of pain, suffering, and death be something actually that is, can be quite beautiful and quite, uh, quite a sight to behold? Um, and how it is that we sort of uh, uh, negotiate the, the sort of again, this, those feelings of horror and dread and fear with the feelings of awe and beauty and wonder uh, that sometimes come out of, in particular, uh, high art and, and, and the, the best examples uh, of the horror genre. So, you know, with that brief overview in mind, uh, why don't we start with that first question. What is it about horror that we actually enjoy? Why is it that people are deliberately sign up and take their time and money, go out of their way in order to go be scared? Uh, two common elements that sort of are encountered in horror fiction are fear and disgust. And these are both sort of primal emotive reactions. But they're emotive reactions that in many forms, most people do everything they can to avoid. Uh, a, a lot of people, even people who generally like horror fiction, want to avoid being scared or disgusted in their daily life, in most of it. It's only in this very sort of select attitude or feeling where they, they deliberately want to go there to be uh, scared or disgusted. Um, and it, it's it's not too hard to sort of see why. I mean, you know, the sorts of things that happen frequently in horror films, you know, a, a obvious example would be sort of you know, gruesome murders. If these things happened in our real life, if, if, if someone down the street from you was brutally and viciously assaulted, that wouldn't be something that you would find entertaining. That was something that you would be, you'd be, be horrified by in sort of the more uh, uh, principled sense. You, you, you wouldn't want it to happen. You would hate it. Uh, you would despise it. You, wish, you would wish it didn't happen. But when it happens up on a silver screen or in, in, in the context of a novel, it somehow becomes something that's sort of, you know, on, on the lowbrow end of things, entertainment. Uh, but then it's sort of a, a, a deeper, more reflective sense of things that somehow ends up giving us something that is profoundly meaningful in our lives. So uh, uh, why should it be? Why should it be that people pay good money to experience these, these terrible things in a fictionalized context? And there's, there's a whole sort of host of different sort of answers you can give to this, a few sort of quick theories. And then, like I said, there's sort of an evolutionary story that you can tell here. You know, human beings, like pretty much all animals in the face of this earth, have spent most of our existence in, in a state of fear of predation. You know, we're, we're constantly afraid that someone's going to come along and kill us. Uh, and so we, we're sort of hardwired in a lot of ways to respond uh, to fear. And, uh, you know, the, the genes that have been passed on sort of keep us in this sort of fight or flight 
reflex scenario. Um, and if you know we we don't sort of get that sort of that, that stimulation, then this sort of this there's a sort of natural part of our brain which is sort of left uh, unsatisfied. If we were in a constant state of terror all the time, you know, if our if our adrenaline systems were were, were sort of just overloaded, you know, we would absolutely break down. But in small controlled bursts, that little hint of adrenaline can really sort of make us feel alive and make us feel in touch with our primal selves. And that can really sort of uh, uh, bring out something in us which is truly, truly enjoyable. Uh, there's also an old story dating back as far as Aristotle, uh, and this is his sort of dramatic modeling of the relationship between what he calls catharsis and cathexis. Uh, now, catharsis is probably the more well-known of those two things. You know, catharsis is sort of this, this purging of emotion. You know, uh, this was his theory of tragedy, right? You, you, why do people go to see tragedy? Why do people go to see Oedipus uh, uh, gouge his own eyes out, right? What's, uh, how is this something that actually attracts people? Uh, well, uh, you know, as Aristotle sees it, we have this sort of emotional buildup in our daily lives. Uh, uh, and and uh, we get to sort of see these incredibly powerful emotions expunged on the stage and it's sort of a release for us. That's the, the sort of the catharsis side. Uh, but the cathexis side is, is sort of the necessary buildup to that. You know, it, it, it's how the work of art sort of uh, imbues us with emotion, gets us emotionally invested and sort of carries us along and makes us care about Oedipus or whomever uh, the, the star of the story is. Um, and by, by getting us sort of emotionally invested and getting this, this sort of emotional buildup, we and then we have this incredible emotional release. This, we, have, we have this sort of hydraulic relationship between, between the, 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 the surging up of the, uh, of the emotional investment and the release of the fear and the and the, the denouement of the, the play or the film or the book. There's also uh, a relationship here between sort of uh, th this relief of, uh, the, of catharsis that Aristotle talks about and, and the notion of wish fulfillment. Uh, you know, there, there, there's many horror movies where they're sort of specifically designed to, to, to give a feeling of justice uh, that happens to us. You know, the, the, the revenge horror film, uh, something like, for example, The Hills Have Eyes would be an excellent example of this, right? It's a story about a young girl who was raped and then the, her... her uh, parents get revenge on the, the people who did it. You know, by, by, by allowing us sort of to indulge in these revenge fantasies, we somehow uh, reclaim an idea that the things make sense in the world. So we can deal with these horrific elements, provided that by the end of the film, uh, the killer gets what's coming to them. Uh, the, the hero triumphs over them. Uh, it, it brings us back to this state of equilibrium uh, where we feel like everything makes sense and all is right with the world. But of course, that's only a certain kind of horror film that, that resolves in that way. There's other horror films that don't sort of give us that wish fulfillment. In fact, there's other horror films which deliberately play off that wish fulfillment. They make you want that kind of justice, that kind of revenge, uh, and then they deliberately hold it back from you. Um, so uh, the, the, the related to this, then again, is this, this notion of uh, uh, that somehow horror can provide us with a sense of superiority over um, uh, uh, the, 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 the people who are depicted in the film. Standard example of this again would be something like slasher films. You know, the slasher films. Uh, you know, were born in the 1960s, you know, and then, uh, uh, ramped up in the 70s and sort of peaked in the 1980s. And, and this was the period, again, like a, like a second wave feminism, right? And, and the, 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 the sort of standard stock and trade of a slasher film, right? Young teenage couple has sex, transgresses on that, that social taboo, and then the killer comes along and, 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 and takes them. Uh, uh, and sort of, so you can sort of, sort of uh, uh, look down upon these people with a sense of, sort of moral superiority. You see them as being sort of judged by the film, and you can sort of get along and, 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 and sort of uh, shame them either for, you know, for, for, for having sex if you have a sort of a puritanical moralistic uh, bent, or if you are perhaps a young, sexually frustrated teenage male, which is of course probably the principal audience for slasher films, this idea of, you know, I can't have sex, you shouldn't either, um, and you sort of get that, again, that, that, that sense that uh, there's, again, a, a sort of a return to justice uh, uh, by, by allowing the audience to feel that they can look down on this, this representation of uh, uh, whatever it is that, that ails them, whatever it is they feel is wrong with society or wrong uh, with, with certain kinds of behaviors. And then lastly, uh, there's sort of the immunity or kitsch thesis. This is uh, related a lot to, uh, to theories about humor. This philosophical theories about why, why human beings enjoy humor, why we like to laugh at things. Uh, and and, and uh, when sort of adopted for the context of, uh, of horror, what the, you know, the, the, the obvious example here would sort of be the, the campiest or the kitschiest sorts of horror films, the, the ones that start to become self-aware. Uh, you, know, you know, we're talking about slasher films a moment ago. If you think about sort of the later films in the Friday the 13th series or the later films in the 
the Child's Play Chucky series, where it sort of deliberately becomes kind of campy and deliberately becomes sort of silly. Um, and then so, so by taking these sorts of horrific images and, and, and things which, you know, perhaps, you know, if, you, if like me, you grew up on Friday the 13th and Child's Play films, these things which used to scare us and turn it into something silly, it gives you a sense of empowerment, right? You're no longer scared. You have grown up, you are, you are more mature, and now these things which used to keep you terrified are now a source of humor. Um, uh, and it, it sort of allows you to sort of build up that sense that, that you can't be touched by the world in this way. So again, that's a short sort of summary there of, of, of some ideas about why we enjoy horror. I'm gonna sort of take a pause now and hand it over to the rest of the panel that, to see if you guys have any thoughts, if you wanna add any other theories to this, or if you wanna sort of question or reflect on any of uh, uh, the particular theories I put up there. Uh, you know, I would, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. I have, I have one. I, 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 I don't want to add sort of not not unique, unique but it's a combination of, uh, of of other points you brought up, and that's that there's um, part of you know embedded to our, our genes is this fear of death, and so watching others die can release that tension and curiosity about what death is. But on top of that, uh, there it could even satisfy a death wish that we may all have that comes from uh, experiencing the terror of everyday life and watching other people die, even in exaggerated brutality, can uh, release some of that that tension in the way that the theater can be a catharsis for us. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna talk about death in some more depth uh, uh, toward the end. It's one of the, um, one of the sort of last things I wanna, I wanna touch on, but, uh, but definitely you can see how, uh, how, how an exploration of death would sort of fit into some of these, uh, these themes. From from my perspective, it seems that um, a lot of horror is, and indeed a lot of learning, it is done in an imitative sort of style. You know, the, in in the, in a in the sense of being a simulation. Um, a lot of the times, we learn how to we learn how to play, we learn how to fight, we learn how to cook. You know, by by watching people do things that are related to these activities, and and you know, sort of uh, maybe even being guided through them if mentally, you know, by a cookbook or what have you, or, or by an actual teacher. Um, and it seems to me that horror is it, possibly some of the appeal comes from the same, comes from the same sort of uh, uh, process where you're looking at something awful before it actually happens to you you're looking at the potentiality of awful things that you know exist in life and now you're getting to sort of see them fr from a detached perspective uh, and maybe as you say you know from a safe perspective and and you can sort of uh process that in a way that you wouldn't if it if some horrible event were to happen to you personally and happen upon you suddenly and I think that's fascinating because you know you can you can if you're talking about death you know again you, you uh, as Jonah mentioned you can treat uh, horror as can sort of a, a sort of a dress rehearsal for death which is a phrase I'm going to use later coming from Stephen King um, but uh, uh, if you're talking about something other than death you know because obviously you, uh, you, you, there's lots of other horrifying things in life besides that if you think about like uh, rape for example right uh, you can you can you certainly use horror fiction as a way. Uh, either sort of by directly talking about or by talking about something that's sort of a metaphorical rape um, uh, uh, as a way sort of to, 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 to steal yourself for the possibility of that, to sort of give you an emotional distance uh, um, and treat it as something that is abstract um, and, uh, you know, hopefully not for preparing for it in real life, because again, well, whereas death is inevitable, uh, one would hope that rape certainly is not, um, uh, uh, but for, for the possibility um, it's something that's uh, it, it might sort of allow us a kind of emotional distance uh, to, 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 to treat it as an abstraction rather than as something which is crippling. I, I think that, I mean, for me, I, I, horror films are just another subset of genres or uh, another subset of uh, dramas, I should say. Whereas, um, you know, in many dramas, I'm, I'm looking for sort of a emotional attachment to the character. In, in horror films, it's as 
it's the same type of emotional attachment, yet I know that something awful is going to happen. Um, and so I, I, the horror films that I like aren't the sort of kitsch horror films like uh, like the Friday the Thirteenth, the 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 later uh, the uh, fun campy ones, but more. Um, I just saw, uh, for example, uh, Creep not too long ago, something that's been talked about often on the podcast. And that that seemed very much like a, this is a, a friendship gone awry kind of drama. And of course it ends, there's, there's, a, uh, there's an ending there that's, that's particularly horrific. So uh, like, what do you think about horror in, I know you talked about Aristotle's catharsis and cathexis, and it seems like it seems to me that um, a lot of what Aristotle has to say about drama and poetics as a whole has uh, has to do similarly with with uh, the genre that we have sort of adopted as horror. What? How do you think about that relationship? Do you think that that relationship is is strong or tenuous or getting more tenuous as time goes on and or it gets more specialized. Just to clarify, Jim, um, are you saying that basically horror is drama in caricature? Is that basically what your analysis is boiling down to? Um, I'm saying horror is drama with uh, not a, a an assuredly not uh, happy ending, or it, it, that. It, okay, so for example, the movie Closer, which is clearly classified as a drama, um, but there's, and I guess I need to sort of uh, refine this a little bit more. Uh, cl Closer is classified as a drama, yet we know that there's not going to be any blood or guts or, you know, Jason isn't going to come in or there isn't going to be a ghost at the end or blah, blah, blah. So we know that there are generic expectations that we expect from a horror film, a ghost, a, a, um, blood and guts, et cetera, et cetera, that we wouldn't expect of a drama. Yet the structures of many of those, uh, of those films are very similar, horror and, genre, and drama. Does that make sense, Antonio? Yeah, it does. Um, and, and honestly, I think there's probably a lot of overlap between the, between the concept of, you know, um, that you just expressed and sort of um, the notion of horror as a, as a, as drama given elements of caricature, you know, as, as you said, there's sort of trope like elements that we expect from horror movies that we don't expect from standard dramas. But if you ask yourself, what are these standard, like, like you mentioned creep, for example, and I think this is a good, this is a good point to, uh, of discussion because, um, you know, yes, creep is sort of about a friendship gone awry, and it's easy to imagine a version of creep that is a drama that doesn't have horrific elements. That's just about you know uh, two people who bump into each other and have a, a develop an unlikely relationship, and then it ends up you know that one of them is kind of twisted and it goes really dark. It's easy to to imagine creep as to reimagine creep in that in that sort of mindset. And so you have, you ask yourself what what are the elements in creep that dis, that differentiate it from this kind of just elementary sort of drama uh, that we would otherwise maybe cast the story in, and you know these are largely elements of exaggeration. You know you see that he's got a crazy mask in his basement, and then you see that he's got an axe, and he's out for blood, not just for emotional you know uh, payback or what have you, you know? And so these are these, it seems to me that these are elements of, like I said, kind of like caricature, that these are elements of, uh, that are exaggerated versus um, their more normal dramatic elements. They're sort of, they're sort of like the, maybe the transgressive flip side of normal dr dramatic elements. So building on that, because yeah, I think that there's definitely, you know, part of what makes the kitschier films kitschy is precisely because they start to become self-aware, and you know, almost sort of postmodern in a certain way. They start to recognize the, the 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 cliches of the genre, and rather than shying away from them, they deliberately play into them. Um, and you know, I don't know if that's necessarily unique to horror, but I do think it's something that that, that is. Uh, exaggerated uh, in horror, precisely for the reasons you're talking about, Antonio. And 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 Jim, like you're saying, you know, you know, we when we go into a film knowing it's a horror film or knowing it's a romantic comedy or whatever, we have certain expectations. And I think in many ways, the the best films in any genre 
are the ones that manage sort of to thwart those expectations. So in, in the context of horror, a film which you know, I know Jim and I have a history with, uh, Bug, uh, is a film which I absolutely love precisely because I, I could not tell where the film was going. You know, it completely subverted my ability to second guess what was going on, and I could not anticipate what was going to happen next. And that, uh, I think, was a, it's a remarkably rare experience when you see as many films as, well, we all have. Uh, uh, so uh, for, when, when a film of any variety can do that, it's, it's an amazing thing. And in the context of a horror film, it's, it, it's particularly fantastic, precisely because there are so many tropes and so many things that you can sort of uh, come to expect reliably uh, that when a filmmaker can can step outside of those uh, and give you something really novel. Uh, it, it's, it's really, really special. Okay, I do want to move on. Uh, uh, we, I do want to, we want to make sure we're not here uh, all night. Um, so, so next question, why is it that we find horror scary? Um, uh, again, this is related to an old question that Aristotle deals with about why we find things funny um, uh, or, or why we find drama engrossing. Uh, you know, if we're watching a movie in a movie theater, uh, we understand that we are perfectly safe. We understand that Freddie and Jason isn't going to come out in the real world and get us. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's something that the rational part of our brain understands this is pure fiction. This isn't real. No one's going to harm us. We're assuming you're not, not actually a child. You, you understand this. You know, uh, uh, adults understand that, that fiction isn't real. Uh, yet somehow when we go into the theater, we still end up being scared. Um, it, it's a strange sort of phenomenon that something that we fully understand that the rational cognitive sides of our brains see these things as as harmless fiction, um, but nonetheless, sort of the the the, the rational understanding just gets overpowered by this sort of basal, even limbic part of ourselves, uh, which is. Uh, uh, terrified of, of whatever's going to happen. And again, as Aristotle says, we have this emotional investment, we have this cathexis in which we sort of get, get drawn in, and that cathexis allows us to fool ourselves into believing that what's happening here, even though we know it's not real, somehow matters in a deep and profound sense. It's some, it's, it, it takes us to a place where the fact that it isn't real is, is less significant than the, fact, uh, 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 the facts about what it makes us feel. Now, in sort of straight up drama, we often speak of uh, you know, the, the willful suspension of disbelief, right? There's, there's things that don't quite make sense in the narrative. There's certain assumptions that a story is asking us to make that we understand aren't necessarily rational or sensible or depart in some way from the real world. Uh, but we, we set aside those criticisms for the purpose of letting the story try to, try to do its magic. Uh, so we, we set the dis disbelief aside so that we can become enraptured in it. Uh, but in the, in the context of horror, there, there's sort of something sort of strange going on here, precisely because it doesn't really seem like it is a willful suspension of disbelief, because it's not entirely clear how much of this is really under the control of our will. Uh, you know, if, if, again, if the filmmakers are doing their job right, uh, if, if, if they are really getting us sort of in, in, in the gut, in the primal parts of ourself, uh, that, that starts to really get afraid, um, then it's it, it's not something where we're suspending it by any, by any sort of choice of will and, le and letting itself get taken away. I mean, sure, I suppose we might be able to fight back. You know, we try to tell ourselves, it's just a movie, calm down. But even when we do that, we still find ourselves so emotionally invested and so wrapped up in it that even these acts of will, of trying to sort of push back against it sort of have to take a, a, you know, a, a, even a heroic amount of effort, but an extra amount of effort than you would imagine it would take if this was purely an act of will. Um, so again, it's this notion of, of, again, of a primal fear, um, uh, these, these, these sort of evolutionarily ancient emotions in us uh, makes it something that it's, it seems to, 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 to not really be a question of will. Um, so there, we're sort of left then again with this, with this, 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 you know, you know, this quasi mystery of how uh, uh, we as rational adults uh, can deliberately walk into a place to, to be scared, knowing that we're going to be scared, knowing that it's fake, knowing that it's not real, knowing that no humans were harmed in the making of this picture, as it were, and nonetheless let our emotions run away with us uh, and, and get us overtaken in a, in a way. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm particularly interested, in Jim, and your thoughts here, because I know that you've said that you've, you, you're basically almost never scared when you see films, which I find you know a fascinating reflection. But Jonah, I saw that you had your, your hand up, so so why don't we start with you? You you tell me your thoughts, Jonah, and then we'll, we'll, Jim will go to you next. Well, I'll be quick on this, but like so, a quote that comes to mind is Mark Twain when he says that any emotion, if it's sincere, is involuntary, and so I think that. It's just good storytelling. I mean, we, we have this kind of reaction 
when we're suspense, when we're in suspense or when we're relieved, like when the, when the cop kicks in the door and we're all like, Hey, the good guys are here. And we feel the sense of relief or comedy. We are in comedy. We all know that these situations are fake, but we have these reactions and it's just basically it's a good storyteller who can manipulate your emotions to generate an authentic reaction is uh it's not really it's less about horror and more about the uh the artist who's who's telling the story and how they're telling it, it, yeah, there, it can, there, there's similarities here between yes yeah, something like again like you know, a romance story right you know you feel your heart breaking for the character even though you know that it's not real but i think or joy was that or joy you could feel just yeah. just happiness Sure, sure. But, but again, I think there's something different in the context of horror, um, precisely because for, I mean, certainly not for all horror films, but for many horror films, there's something that we all understand can't happen. When you go to ro a romantic film, two people meet, two people fall in love, and yeah, there may be some things about the story that don't make sense, but by and large, the universe that you're experiencing is a rational, sensible one that makes as much sense as your daily life. But when an undead killer from beyond the grave, or when zombies rise up, or vampires, or werewolves, or whatever, uh, again, assuming you're not a child, you understand those things are fundamentally unreal. Uh, 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 there's there's nothing literally like that out there in the world. I mean, okay, there are serial killers and stuff like that, sure. So again, some some horror films aren't don't fall to this, but a lot of them do. A lot of them involve this supernatural element, and that seems to require something extra above and beyond uh, the, the, your your, your twain quote about uh, every emotion if felt is is involuntary, if sincere is involuntary. It's a, it's, a, it's a good line. It's a good quote. Um, but there's something more paradoxical in the context, I think, of again of supernatural horror. Uh, precisely because there, there's an added element of having to overcome our rationality um, or, or su to subvert our rationality, which, you know, for most people, I think, isn't something that really happens. But maybe that speaks to why Jim is never scared, because he's, he's more rational than most. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I guess. I don't, well, I, I don't want to, like, proclaim myself more rational than, than, than most, but I think that what, as you were talking about uh, you know, our rational understanding is overpowered by fear, as you as you write on the the slide here, and um, willful suspension of disbelief. It like my rational understanding has not been overpowered by fear, except for The Shining, and and even then, I you know I I watched it, I rewatched it, and I wasn't scared. I was just admiring it how fucking good Stanley Kubrick is. Um, so yeah, it's it. it it's sort of just a, a an idiosyncratic response that I have to to horror films, where my rational understanding has not been overpowered. Uh, I have not willfully suspended my disbelief. Uh, and part of that, I think there are three. As I as I've been getting more involved in this podcast, and as Noah have been as Noah. Uh, who you know is not here? We'll pour one out for our friend. Um, our, uh, as, as Noah has been saying throughout most of this podcast, we should examine our fear because our fear um, tells us more about ourselves. Uh, that I've I've tried to undergo that kind of self um, self reflexiveness in order to or reflectiveness to figure out what it is that scares me. And what I've found is that I normally reserve the emotion for fear, uh, a, a motion of fear for shit that happens in my daily life or shit that happens that's, that's, that I'm afraid of the future and, and shit like that. Like that's the stuff that scares me because it's so intimately personally connected. And I think there's a second point is most characters in horror films are so fucking stupid. They're just remarkably stupid human beings. Um, I mean, even we were referencing Creep. There's one moment where the creep sends him a, a DVD and says, please meet me in the park. Fuck you, I'm not gonna meet you in the park, you creepy motherfucker. Like, no way in hell would I, would I think about doing that? Um, I would, you know, send him, you know, the, the name and number of a very good therapist and uh, wish him on his way. I, so I think that these, these, are, these are two of the elements 
And I think the third element that, that keeps me from being scared is, is one of the things you were talking about as well, Garrett, when you were speaking about how, like, uh, the, we put aside our um, predicting the, the next step of the film. Like, I, I, my, my common thing, and I sort of inherited this from my father, who any time a jump scare would come in, would count down the jump scares. So it was like, three, two, one, boo, fuck you movie. And that's kind of, that's, that's, how, I've, uh, that's how I respond to horror movies and why I can, I can claim that aside from The Shining, I've never really gotten scared by, by horror films. So yeah, no, there I, you go. <laughs> I, find, I find that fascinating. And you know, were I a psychologist, I might be more interested in performing some sort of study because uh, yeah, for me, the idea of never having been scared of a film is kind of, it's kind of like hearing that you've never laughed at a comedy. Um, and that to me, again, it feels like you're really missing out on some, some, some good, serious pro proxy emotions. Um, really quick pause again. We're getting some good questions from, from the audience here. Uh, uh, someone asked about sci-fi horror films like uh, Shelley's Frankenstein, um, and then uh, uh, about uh, Jungian archetypes and how that relates to Aristotle stuff. Rest assured, audience, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that stuff a little bit later on. Uh, I'm glad to see you're anticipating where I'm going. Um, so uh, uh, I, I'm seeing your questions, and I will uh, respond to them uh, in time. Uh, please have patience. Um, okay, anyway, but uh, uh, so moving on to, to sort of the next. Oh, yeah, sorry. I had one last point here. Um, part of the thrill yeah, of, of, of a horror film uh, is precisely that you're not in control of your own emotions, right? That, that you, you are surrendering control over to someone else, to the filmmaker, uh, and letting them take the reins of your own emotions. Um, and that's a, that's, a, that's a fascinating situation to be in. It's one of, of, uh, of, of, of trust and, and interplay between audience and artist um, that's, again, is not necessarily exclusive to horror, but I do think it's highlighted and accentuated in horror in particular in interesting ways. Okay, now to, uh, turning to, to, to questions of social commentary. Um, uh, it, it's no sort of uh, a revelation to say that people are often scared of what's happening in their society. You know, people remember the good old days when things were, were, were different and now things are, 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 aren't the way they remember when they were growing up or something like that, or they don't feel that the society is the way it should be. Um, and, and, and that scares them. You know, the idea of, of their society changing in certain ways is, is something that, that is, that's off-putting to, to a lot of people. Um, so, it's hard though, unless you have training in sociology, sort of to really put your finger though on what it is about, what a society is, what, what it precisely it is that's changing, what it used to be. Um, you know, it's, it, it's difficult for, for lay people to really get a handle on this in any sort of, you know, rigorous intellectual academic fashion. And so part of what makes horror films, I think, particularly interesting to us is we can sort of use them as a blanket to throw over the invisible man. Uh, it gives form and shape to something that's there, something that's, that scares us, but precisely because we can't quite see it, it, uh, it, it scares us all the more. Um, and so once you sort of get the, the blanket on top of the invisible man, suddenly it gives you a handle on the problem. It gives you a perspective, uh, a, a lingua franca, a set of metaphors with which to refer to this particular social problem or this particular concern. Um, uh, and you can use it to, to interplay nicely with other people within your culture to reflect on your society in this way. So, so some, some, some examples of this phenomenon. Uh, so uh, Antonio, uh, we did uh, Invasion of the Body Snatch at your behest not too long ago. Um, there's obviously a Cold War sort of metaphor there going on uh, uh, in that film uh, and uh, in the, the, the novel that preceded it, even though the, the novelist explicitly said that the, that wasn't uh, his intention. Uh, nonetheless, in, uh, Body Snatchers is often read as, 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 a, as a Cold War and sort of communist infiltration kind of thing. Uh, in modern day context, you might sort of even see it as fear of immigration, right? Fear of the other you know, moving in and taking over your culture and something like that. Um, uh, you sort of see how this might speak to, to that kind of concern. Uh, uh, the uh, Joseph W. Campbell's short story, Who Goes There, which was later adapted uh, into the film The Thing from Outer Space, and then John Carpenter remade that as The Thing, uh, also has the same sort of Cold War metaphor. Uh, uh, Campbell's short story is a masterpiece. If you haven't read it, I cannot recommend it enough. And of course, The Thing is a classic uh, sci-fi horror movie, um, uh, 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 you know, worthy of all the praise, one of John Carpenter's best films. 
Uh, and again, it has this sort of a theme of how, how can I trust the person next to me? How do I know that my neighbor is not an inhuman monster? Uh, and that sort of lingering suspicion, uh, that, that fear of the other, that fear that you can't really trust other people to really be decent, good people, to be the people they appear to be, uh, is something which, you know, you know it, it, it's something that horror explores in a really, really powerful and compelling fashion. Uh, George Romero did double duty on this one, uh, uh, both with, with uh, Night of the Living Dead and then Dawn of the Dead uh, several years later. Night of the Living Dead you know, was an incredibly subversive film uh, precisely because the, of the way it tackled race relations. I mean, again, I, 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 it's it, that, that incredibly powerful closing scene, uh, which, you know, I won't, you know, most people probably have seen it. I don't want to spoil it just in case, but suffice to say, uh, it, it, it hangs a lantern on uh, the incredible challenging and, and difficult nature of, of, of black-white relations, especially at the time, but of course, things still going on today uh, with you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and so forth. Uh, it, it, Night of the Living Dead is no less timely now than it ever has been. Um, and then Dawn of the Dead, of course, was a reflection on consumerism, right? And then sort of the zombies taking over the mall and this, the, the, sort of going through like uh, mindless shoppers, just consume, consume, consume. Um, uh, and it, it, uh, as so as social criticism there, wrote, wrote, I think few filmmakers have managed to, to hit the nail on the head, not once, but twice, quite as effectively as Romero did with those two films. Um, now, Toby Hooper's Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a personal favorite of mine uh, because, you know, Hooper, apparently the, the, the origin for the story was they, 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 the filmmakers wanted to do a story about factory farming uh, and, and the horrors of what animals go through in, in a factory farm, but they quickly found that there was no sort of direct way in which they could sort of tackle that horror. Uh, so they decided to sort of transmute it and say, okay, let's make a film where human beings are treated like cows and pigs are in a factory farm, hung up on meat hooks, chopped up in this way. Um, and, you know, and, the, and the apparatuses which they use, you know, in, in this film, the axes, the cleavers, you know, and of course, and this is the whole cannibalism side of, of the story. Uh, all sort of reflect the content of, of modern factory farms. So again, as a, as a, as a moral vegetarian, moral vegan, uh, this is, this is uh, something which I, I'm, I'm always amazed at how many people love this film, and yet that aspect of it, that sort of metaphorical side of it, is, is, is often lost on them, because it seems to me, I don't know how much more they could hit you over the head with it, I don't know how much more obvious they could, that the filmmaker could try to make it. Um, uh, but alas, there it is, I suppose. We're, we're always more sensitive to seeing the things that we're particularly attuned to. Uh, yes, and then finally Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, both uh, the novel and the Kenneth Branagh directed uh, uh, film version, which is the definitely more sort of closer uh, uh, reflection of, of, of how the novel works. I mean, uh, uh, Fra uh, Frankenstein, of course, is you know probably the original sort of sci-fi horror novel. Uh, you know, it, it explores the sort of the transgressions. Uh, involved in sort of uh, science and scientific uh, scientific world sort of taking over from you know, the quote unquote natural world uh, and and giving uh, human beings sort of inhuman power uh, power over life and death itself you know modern scientific medicine allowing people to be brought back from the dead literally and sort of this terrifying relationship that human beings have uh, with 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 technology on the, the one hand um, and our sort of our inability to control what we unleash. And, and, you know, this is a theme which has run through uh, up to this day, you know, there's, there's stories about like, you know, nanotechnology and of course artificial intelligence runs with this theme too about how human beings lose the ability to control uh, the, 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 their own creations and how the fear that eventually those creations might come back to destroy us. Uh, um, you know, Shelley was, you know, I think she was 19 when she wrote the novel, which is just absolutely astounding, not only because of its incredible artistry and the prose and how it's written, but how, incre how much incredible foresight is in, is in that novel um, uh, regarding, you know, what, what the future held for, for human beings. And again, it was progenitor for this, this whole kind of um, uh, 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 future going forward uh, for, for science fiction and horror. Um, and then another thing about about Frankenstein, of course, is 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 in particular sort of the the the, the procreative nature of it. It's a story about uh, the creation of life without the necessity for women to be involved. You know, a man creates life himself without the need for a woman, and how that kind of violates. The, the, the natural order of things, the natural boundary of, of things, uh, um, and, and that in and of itself sort of subverts uh, this uh, the, 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 the necessity of women uh, in, in society. And in that sense, it has, you know, it, it's, you know it, it's, I would say it has, but it's a reflection on a kind of sort of misogynistic anti-woman uh, narrative uh, that, that dominates society in a lot of ways.
Uh, and then lastly, the other uh, sci-fi sci horror classic I want to talk about, of course, is Ridley Scott's Alien, uh, which started off, again, as sort of again, a philosophical thought experiment about uh, how how we would think about abortion if, if men could get pregnant. Um, uh, and they the, the, the screenwriter sort of uh, turned this, you know, in, into the, in the original draft of the screenplay actually was, was quite terrible in a lot of ways. But, but it had this sort of fascinating element of, of you know, of, of trying to get men to imagine what it would be like to be raped and to be impregnated by something alien, something they didn't want inside of them, and just the natural horror uh, involved in that. Um, and of course, you know, the imagery uh, uh, and that really Scott sort of harnessed, particularly through H.R. Geiger's artwork, uh, again, is so overtly sexual, right? You know, there, there's the, the, the vagina dentata of, of, of the alien. There's the, 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 the sort of uh, uh, amb ambiguous sort of sexual organs in the face hugger, both the sort of the vagina-like pattern on its uh, uh, right in the center. And then, of course, also the thrusting penis-like element that comes out of it to, to go down the throat of, uh, of the male character. Um, so this, uh, this sort of uh, 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 this, this powerful sort of reflection on the nature of sexuality, uh, uh, of, of unwilling sexuality, of forced pregnancy, and then, of course, uh, abortion is, is, is a theme that runs brilliantly, I think, throughout the original Alien, less so perhaps in the, in the later films, but then when they shift more to sort of action and away from horror, uh, but, but not for nothing that I think, again, that the, that the original Alien film is considered to be the best film uh, in that series. Uh, uh, precisely for many reasons, not the least of which because it has sort of weightier philosophical themes. Okay, so that's my certainly not comprehensive list, but a, hopefully a sort of a, a, an illustrative list of the ways in which uh, uh, horror fiction can be used to sort of highlight social problems uh, and to sort of talk about them in sort of an indirect way. As I say, to throw the blanket over the invisible man. Uh, I want to sort of hand it over to you guys now and ask if you guys have any other sort of examples or thoughts about my examples or, or, or other sorts of uh, reflections on this idea. Well, I just want to add that Mark Kermode, and I know you've seen this video, talks about how you were talking about, you know, how our creations uh, grow, um, are more intelligent than us. And he has a whole video about, if you look up Mark Kermode, Scary Kids, he has like a, like a five minute uh, sort of like treatise on how all these horror films about like, uh, what was that movie? Oh, um, the name is not coming to me. Village of the Damned. What's that? Village of the Damned. Yeah. Thank you. God damn it. Thank you. That and um, uh, we need to talk about Kevin about how kids are smarter than uh, the their adults and how scary that is. About how he brings this continues in uh, Clockwork Orange. How the slang that they use is unknown by the adults, and uh, he listens to classical music. So. It's like he's not only is he's refined, but he's also rebellious. And it's that going back to the good old days, it's that parent, it's that there's this uh, pedophilic fear that uh, that um, our ch I'm not I I'm a little not really coherent right now. I think it's be pedophobic. Pedo right. Fear of children, right? Pedophobic. Yes. For forgive me. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, exactly. It's pedophobic. So um, I hope that makes I hope I'm not really articulating this that clearly, and I apologize for that. It's a little embarrassing that I can't. I'm on the moon right now. I think. But, go ahead. I go ahead, Jonah. If you want to. No, I was just gonna. I'm just basically repeating myself. But he, his whole thesis in this video is just that. Uh, why are we afraid of uh, children, and why is that such a pervasive theme? in uh, the horror genre. Yeah, and I think, you know, you can throw that in there also with Rosemary's Baby, right? I mean, again, there's the, the idea that, again, this idea that you're impregnated with something which is somehow alien to you and therefore terrifying. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, children are again, a common theme in horror because yeah, children can be really kind of scary and it's uh, 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 something that's, you know, we can ha we can get a perspective on it through horror by by exaggerating some of those underlying fears and exaggerating some of those underlying themes uh, to sort of to, to see that horror in, in, in a light that allows us to deal with it. Eraserhead is another example of that as well, um, but especially because that child becomes becomes particularly monstrous. But yeah, I think. Well, didn't you call them in a previous podcast, uh, Garrett? Little sociopaths, children.
Yeah, yes, I did. Um, uh, when you look at the way their their psychology develops, technically speaking, at the early on in the stages, they have the inability to recognize the, the psychological and moral realities of, of other people as people. Um, they, they only have their own universe that they're fully cognizant of. And yeah, technically, that kind of makes them like, a, like sociopaths. <laughs> There's a Louis C.K. joke. Never has there been a child who's like, oh, you're busy? I'm sorry. I'll just wait a second. I apologize. Um, but yeah, I... Yeah, I think a lot of the, uh, the the examples that you gave here were spot on. I think we can add uh, thousands of other films that are well, not thousands, but many other films that are um, that are also social commentaries, or that you could read a social commentary into. Um, we were just doing that a couple of weeks ago with uh, our our silent cat classic, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And uh, I'm sure we'll be doing that on future episodes as well. Um, but yeah, I think it, for me, it seems like the social, so, social commentary aspects of horror movies are some of the things that make it the most interesting. Um, and I'm especially interested in like further elucidating in my head the, I, I hadn't heard the alien is about abortion thing until tonight. So uh and I'm looking forward to figuring that out a little bit more and how that how that theme fits with the rest of the film. But yeah, they well done. This is a good this is a good list and uh we will add more to it because I think that many horror movies, in fact almost all of them can be read all of the serious ones I should say, can be read with a social commentary lens. Yeah, I, I consider throwing on here uh, uh, Get Out as an obvious example of this exploring race relations, um, but I sort of thought that if I, uh, bringing that up, I would almost want to consider it sort of a, a completely separate thing about race and class uh, and socioeconomic status and stuff like that, because while, while Get Out definitely sort of uh, uh, hit the nail on the head with race better than any other film I've ever seen, uh, it, it does sort of uh, lead into another kind of broader conversation, uh, which I was tempted to have, but in the interests of, of trying to keep things contained, like I said, this is a first pass. Maybe we, we, we'll consider Get Out. I mean, we have we have Deadly Analysis did a podcast on Get Out, of course, um, uh, but so we might sort of consider it in, in this vein in more depth later if, uh, if people want us to. Sure, and Rosemary's Baby, and in fact, the entire devil movie genre, I think, is is about social commentary as well, because there is a sense in which we like to think, and this is a thesis for sort of a larger thing, but I, I think devil movies are about our sort of fear of religion, uh, fear of the opacity of religion in some way, and 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 it's also this really elemental. Um, belief that we want to put the other and put what is evil outside of us, make it the responsibility of an external devil. And I think that's a, certainly there, there are social commentary uh, aspects to that, that. I mean, there are ways in which our society otherizes groups of people and otherizes evil um, as a whole. And I think devil movies as a subgenre of horror films uh, feed into that process. Yeah, and the relationship between horror films and like uh, moral philosophy, again, is something which I've also considered weighing in on. Uh, the old trope about the devil made me do it, all right, about uh, how the relationship, about personal responsibility uh, for our misdeeds uh, and coming to terms with, with who we really are. Uh, yeah, I mean, The Exorcist uh, being one example here. Uh, and of course, the relationship just between religion and horror is another thing which I, I contemplated talking about, but, but sidelined in the interest of time. Um, and speaking of that, I mean, okay, in the, the speaking of the interest of time, uh, let's move on from here now. So, uh, again, like I said, both Frankenstein and Alien have sort of again an explicitly sort of sexual component to them, uh, and so I want to sort of use that as a segue to talking about the relationship between horror and sex. Uh, you know, neuroanatomically, you know, again, the, the 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 parts of our brain which are responsible for sexual arousal and responsible for the the, the fear reflex are closely related. Uh, again, the, the the fight, flight, and fornicate uh, 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 trilogy of, of of human behaviors are are hardwired very much uh, in in sort of the the, the the primal parts of the brain. So it's you know, it's, it, it's it's no surprising to psychologists. That, uh, that horror and sex are, are, are closely intertwined with one another. Uh, and sex in particular has often been a specific target of social critique. 
um, which is what the, you know, the, pre the previous slide was exploring. But I, I want to talk about a few examples here of, of, of sex in horror uh, to sort of illustrate the points in particular. So again, one of the classics here, of course, is Dracula. Uh, again, the idea of, of, of Dracula as seducer, as, ha as having the power to hypnotize women uh, and, and, and take them away. Uh, and turn them to his to the dark side, um, uh, and you know these sorts of images right here again, which are, are you could know, do a Google image search on Dracula and try to find one that uh, that doesn't have a sexual sort of uh, uh, connotation to it. Uh, it is actually a bit of a challenge. Um, so the the, the, you know, the the classic sort of picture here of again again is this or or Bane count or, or Bane count uh, being turned into a monster and then turning women into monsters by penetrating them with this sort of oral fixation uh, uh, and then of course the thirst and the lust uh, uh, for blood that comes after it. Um, you know, I've, we've talked about the slasher film before. I find this this poster for Friday the Thirteenth Part Three. I mean, can you so really can you get sort of more more phallic here, right? Sort of the penetration of the curtain and the blood. It's it, it's really you know you don't have to be a Freudian to sort of see the the the, the incredible sort of sexual imagery here uh, uh, in this. And again, while I think the poster uh, illustrates it well, uh, it's again it's slasher films in general sort of have this idea again of you being penetrated, uh, you know, especially against your will. Again, there's sort of the rape metaphor there, uh, which is horrifying. And again, it's, it's, it's not for nothing that pretty much all slasher films end with two of the same beats, right? The the bad guy gets killed, justice is restored, the killer, the rapist, the whatever, uh, gets his comeuppance, and everyone settles down, but then he, you know, you get the hint that he will rise again and come back, which again sort of plays through this idea of, you know, of even if you even if you catch the rapist, even if you punish him, uh, there's always more out there. You know, the, you're, you're, you're never going to be be able to fully escape the the, the evil of, uh, of of this this horrible horrible violation. Um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, again a favorite of mine. Uh, uh, it, it's you know something that a show that I can't recommend enough to people. Um, which is it's kind of interesting in some ways because it, it, it's it has a lot of traditional horror elements, but it, a lot of its fan base aren't people who typically like horror films. You know, there, there's much more sort of, you know, of, of a female uh, horror base for a female fan base for Buffy the Vampire Slayer, whereas the horror base or the fan base for horror films is much more traditionally male. Um, but the the you know. Uh, uh, as Joss Whedon said in the commentary uh, in, 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 in season two for one of the ones he commented on, uh, you know, there's, there's a scene where, where, where Buffy sleeps with her, her boyfriend Angel. Uh, Angel gets his, uh, uh, loses his soul again and becomes a, 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 a vampire without a soul. He was a vampire before, but he was a vampire with a soul. He loses his soul and he becomes a monster again. Uh, and as Whedon said, for him, it was sort of this, this, this exploration of, you know, the, the young girl sleeps with a boyfriend for the first time, and then he doesn't call her. You know, he was so sweet before, and now he's this uncaring monster. And so he was sort of wanting to sort of exaggerate that, take that. You know, it's not just that he's not calling you, he's actually out ripping out the throats of homeless people. Uh, um, and, then, and then she has to sort of overcome and fight back against that. Uh, and, you know, again, we, I could do a whole whole thing on philosophy and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. This is at least one, I think maybe even two books on philosophy and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, uh, they're, they're fascinating reads and lots of fun. Uh, but again, I, I only touch on it here uh, uh, for, for a moment. Uh, uh, one of Noah's favorites, recent film, It Follows. We're going to, of course, there's, there's the, the, the sort of the, the sexually transmitted disease metaphor, and It Follows is sort of obvious. You know, some people even thought it was too heavy handed. Um, uh, uh, I, I think I, I liked it less than Noah, but perhaps more than Jim. Um, uh, it, it, and it, it, but whether you like it or you don't like it, again, it clearly sort of is exploring this idea, again, of the consequences of sex. Uh, of, of how um, you know, e e e sex in some ways can't be casual, right? It, ha it always carries a gravity. It always follows you. Your sexual history comes up, whether it be from a sexually transmitted disease or just from having to tell your future prospects about your sexual history and how there can be guilt involved or possibly shame involved in that. Uh, and this sort of again, so this sort of psychological melodrama, which is again a very common story, I think, is is explored through the nice metaphor, and and it follows. And then there's sort of a separate subgenre uh, uh, in this regard of about how horror films have treated gay people as particularly monstrous. You know, as the, the, the gay person as the monster in the closet. Uh, you know, there's there's a, there's a chapter in the film, in the book, the, the Celluloid Closet, which talks about horror films in particular uh, and the way gay people are sort of presented in them. Uh, so one of the oldest examples here is Alfred Hitchcock's uh, a, a thriller Rope, uh, which opens up with a man being strangled, uh, and then it's a sort of a cat and mouse game. Uh, to see if the killers are going to get caught. And while it's never explicitly said 
in the film, it's highly implied that the two killers in the film are uh, a gay couple. Uh, and so while, while it's subtext, it's, it's sort of barely subtext. And it's something I think that, that the gay community rightly sort of rebels against this portrayal in, of, of Hitchcock and in other films of the time as well of, of you know, you know, uh, of gay people as being one of two, two things in the films. They're either the victim or they are the monster. Um, uh, they're, they're, they're all, all, you know, for, for a long time, at least, they were never really the heroes. They, they, they never were the sort of the survivors. Uh, uh, they were always the victims or the, the, the murderers. And, and this is, of course, was, was a stigma that sort of hung over the gay community for a very long time and only recently has started to sort of be pushed back against. Uh, so uh, Tony Scott, really Scott's brother, uh, uh, his film *The Hunger*, I think, was was an interesting sort of turning point in this. Uh, again, it's another vampire story, um, uh, but it's a vampire story that sort of explores an explicit sort of lesbian relationship. And while it is still sort of a violatory relationship, uh, 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 Catherine Deneuve pl you know, plays uh, you know, this, this sort of female vampire who's seducing the human Susan Sarandon, uh, uh, w w along with the companionship of the, of the always wonderful David Bowie. Um, you 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 have this sort of again this, this transgression sexuality, uh, there's this turn to the dark side, again, this sort of, it, 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 the metaphor again of, of the, the, the lesbian sort of seducing the straight woman, turning her into a gay woman. So there, there, there is still sort of these, these sort of negative tropes in the film, but contrary to something like what you see in, in Rope, uh, uh, these are the heroes, right? You know, the, 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 the focus, the center of the film is on their experience from their point of view. So while they are monsters, they're sympathetic monsters. There's sort of a sympathy for the devil kind of uh, a relationship that the audience has with the characters in The Hunger. So in some ways, you know, this film was like I think 1982, I think it came out. It sort of exists sort of in this sort of, the, this, this middle ground, this, this, this starting this turning away from that sort of celluloid closet uh, uh, where technically you still have uh, the, the the gay person as uh, as monster, uh, it, it starts to become a more sympathetic portrayal um, uh, rather than a, a sort of purely sort of horrific, ghastly, otherly kind of portrayal of gay people. Uh, and then coming full circle again to, to, to around where where you can sort of uh, where I think this sort of silly classical starts to break down completely uh, is with Anne Rice's uh, novel and then the, the, later the film uh, Interview with a Vampire. Uh, again, the the homoerotic relationship between Lestat and um, oh crap, I'm blanking on the other character's name. Uh, um, uh, but 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 the, the Louis. two. It's Louis. Louis, thank you. Yes, Louis. Uh, uh, the homoerotic relationship between the two of them, you know, is, is you know, again, it, it, it's you can view it as subtext or you can view it as text. You know, but Anne Rice has been quite clear; it was deliberate. Uh, it, it, she, she very much viewed the Interview with the Vampire as sort of a, 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 a pro-gay celebration of horror. Um, so again, uh, you, you, you start with Dracula. You know, Dracula seducing the women. Now we have men seducing men. It normalizes the homosexual relationship. Uh, and even though, again, technically they are still monsters, they are our heroes. You know, we. we or root for them. Uh, uh, they, 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 they are no longer human, but at the same time, they are just so human. Uh, and so, so the sort of the, 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 the coming full circle uh, uh, through, through horror fiction, uh, the representation of gay people uh, in, in cinema uh, as, as becoming sort of more fully human, more fully autonomous, of, of, of claiming their sexuality as a right, as something that, uh, that isn't, uh, uh, that, that can be horrifying, but no, necess not necessarily more horrifying uh, than any kind of straight sexuality. Uh, so yeah, again, obviously a lot more could be said about uh, this too. But I will again pause to sort of to get your guys' insight and, and, and reflections on on this. I want to throw in a few examples of transgender people being um, depicted as as the monster in the closet, uh, specifically dressed to kill. Also, um, there's a cross-dressing scene in Raising Cain, uh, Brian, both Brian De Palma films, maybe that's an issue. Uh, and then <laughs> there's uh, also uh, The Silence of the Lambs, which is is problematic in its its depiction of transgender, although uh, Garrett, you told me a story some time ago that Jonathan Demme uh, uh, never apologized for the film, but certainly uh, did as much as as he could uh, to to support the transgender community. Um, what's what's interesting is all of this sort of tracks with mainstream drama as well. Uh, there's an Al Pacino film, um, the name of which is uh, is is blanking on me right now, where he is a 
uh, a cop who goes undercover to, I'm sort of looking it up, and um, he's a cop who goes undercover to, to um, infiltrate the gay community. It's called Cruising, and uh, it's once again about gay people as monsters in the closet. There's a, there's a gay killer and he is, uh, he is uh, pretending to be gay so he could root out the bad uh, gay killer. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of these, uh, like this, what tracks in the horror movie genre also tracks in, in dramatic films as well. Um, and then we get positive portrayals of homosexuals in and transgender people in uh, the world according to Garp, which happens mid '80s, mid to early '80s, and um, uh, d positive depictions of gay people in My Beautiful Laundrette, which which happens uh, later '80s as well. Daniel, one of Daniel Day Lewis's uh, mid '80s, yeah, uh, one of Daniel Day Lewis's first and and fantastic roles. So. Yeah, and uh, so to take what's probably the polar cinematic opposite of anything Daniel Day-Lewis has ever been in, um, I'm reminded now that this is the 30th anniversary of Hellraiser, um, and you know Hellraiser sort of is explicitly the sort of exploration of BDSM uh, sexual psychology. Uh, Clive Barker, of course, is a gay man, uh, and uh, he, it's his own experiences in BDSM clubs sort of informed uh, this idea of, of you know of, of the search for for, for uh, pleasures of the flesh. That are that are so ecstatic that they transcend even any sort of possible natural uh, human condition, um, and it, you know it comes at the expense of losing your soul and opening the, the the path to hell. And again, of course, there is the religious overtones of gay people of being uh, uh, bound for hell and so forth. So yeah, that would be another sort of example of, 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 of again a film which is again, unabashedly a horror film, but uh, carrying with it some pretty weighty themes of about homosexuality and deviant sexualities. Uh, in a rather sort of uh, eye-opening and uh, progressive fashion. So, any, anyone else want to weigh in on, on horror and sex, or should we move on? Well, I could po talk about horror and sex all night long, but uh, we should probably uh, move on. Oh. All right, fair enough. Okay, um, so on the turn on talking about you know, human nature more broadly. Obviously, sex is a big part of human nature, um, but we can speak now to uh, uh, to so, so, some more general sorts of themes. Um, so, you know, if you when you think when you sort of look at human beings full on in their face without flinching, we can be pretty horrific in and of ourselves. Uh, you know, uh, some horror movies are sort of directly patterned on not supernatural things, but on real atrocities that human beings have actually committed, from anything from rape uh, to murder to, to, to genocide or kidnapping. Um, and, you know, uh, even if we aren't committing atrocities, we're often sort of indifferent to the suffering of other people. We, we turn a blind eye, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we don't really care, we, we tune out, we say out of sight, out of mind. Um, and then also there's the fact that even, you know, if you don't think about how humans relate to other people, about how we relate to ourselves, about how often we lie to ourselves, about how often, you know, we, we don't want to look at the, the failings of ourselves, the moral failings, the social failings. We don't like to sort of think about ourselves as being the kind of person who could commit an atrocity, even though we have. We don't like to think about ourselves as the kind of person who would turn a blind eye to the suffering of others, even though we have. Uh, and so, you know, horror fiction here can sort of come in and give us uh, 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 a, 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 a mirror in which to see ourselves indirectly. So in the same way that you can't sort of look Medusa straight in the face because she turns you to stone, uh, but you can use the mirror to, to confront her. Uh, we can sort of use horror fiction as that mirror to confront ourselves in an indirect fashion rather than, than sort of recognizing in a way that might be sort of just completely crushing to our sense of self if we were sort of fully uh, uh, we're to fully face it directly, uh, we, we can sort of uh, uh, treat fictional avatars as uh, uh, ways of exploring these kind of uh, uh, ugly, negative side of ourselves. So uh, again, so, uh, uh, Larissa Key from the, 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 the uh, uh, chat asked about sort of how Jungian archetypes relate to Aristotle's cathartic and cathexis uh, um, and, and how it is that, you know, uh, uh, every person has a dark side of themselves, the shadow self. Um, that we don't want to face. That is, it is primal. It taps into this kind of collective unconsciousness. Um, and indeed, the very use of a word like monster is sort of used precisely to distance ourselves from people who commit terrible things. We say Hitler was a monster. Stalin was a monster. Charles Manson was a monster. So that way, they're not like us. They're not 
They're not, I'm not like that. I couldn't do something like that. They're a monster. I'm a human being. And it's sort of, it's, it's, it's precisely this kind of, you know, this dangerous distance that we sometimes try to put between ourselves and other human beings by turning them into monsters that we can sort of enter into a kind of denial about human nature. And so, I mean, again, this is but one measure of quality here, but you know, you might propose that, you know, that, that, that bad horror films are ones that entrench this sort of distance, that, that allow us to be more comfortable in this false picture of human nature, uh, uh, of, of, of me being the kind of person who would never do something like that. Uh, and whereas good horror films are films that sort of force us to own up to our own culpability, to our own human failings, and to our own uh, uh, kinds of uh, uh, moral failings or, 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 or transgressions in the respects in which all of us in some sense have a, a, a line of evil cutting directly through our hearts. So a couple of quick examples here. Obviously, Robert Louis Stevenson's classic, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, is probably the go-to uh, 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 paradigmatic uh, template here. You know, again, the, the educated, urbane Dr. Jekyll has to take the potion to let loose the animal, uh, the, the vindictive Mr. Hyde. Um, and, you know, it's sort of, it, it's, it's presented to us in a lot of ways as though sort of, you know, Jekyll is the real person and Hyde is somehow a corruption of him. But as the story goes on, and I think sort of standard sort of literary interpretation is, is that that's, that's not actually what's going on at all. Mr. Hyde is just as much a real component of, of Dr. Jekyll as, as, as the doctor is. And of course, you know, Dr. Jekyll in this respect, is, is every man, right? Uh, he's all of us. Every, everyone has this kind of darker Jungian shadow side uh, that we want to suppress, that we want to hold back, uh, but oftentimes uh, is, is unsuppressible and we, can, we, we can't hold it back. Uh, William Peter Blatty's The Exorcist, um, and, and uh, both the book version and film version, is another sort of example of this, right? Uh, again, we, we, we mentioned this before, but again, we, we, we can, you can sort of see this as an idea again, of, of, of trying to blame evil on uh, something else. Again, blame evil on, on the devil corrupting us, on something outside of us. Um, but, and I know actually that Blatty did draw on real life exorcist experiences. And I think one of the things which, which always makes me like the novel and the film less is Blatty's sort of insistence that there is an air of realism to it. And uh, any time I heard him do that, I became disconnected to it. The, the idea that, that, that exorcisms like this actually happen, it makes me less morally and psychologically invested in the story. I prefer to see the story again rather as as metaphor for again for the devil inside of all of us uh, for, for for the idea that you know someone an innocent person like Regan uh, could could be corrupted by something uh, again there's sort of a paternalistic element here right that your 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 beautiful young daughter becomes turned into this this horrific monster by some sort of outside force whether it be violent movies or violent rap lyrics or something like that uh, or, or or a bad uh, friend or a bad seed or something like that to to, to me the exorcist is much more compelling when treated as that kind of metaphor for the ways in which human beings can be corrupted, not by supernatural forces, uh, but by things that are indeed all too human. Um, uh, Stephen King's The Shining, again, Jamie mentioned that was, that was the only film that ever actually scared you, um, even though the film and the novel depart in, in different ways. I think uh, uh, they, they, they both sort of touch on uh, something which is, again, I think, genuinely horrifying. King told a story about where the inspiration for The Shining came from. It's, you know, when he was a fairly young writer, one of his sons, who was was very young at the time, came in, apparently spilled some ink over his papers, as it back in the days of typewriters, so it ruined completely uh, several pages of a draft he was working on, he could never recover, and he remembers distinctly thinking, I'm going to kill him. And the second he had that thought, he was immediately horrified with himself, like, my God, this is my son, you know, I, I love my son, where, where did that thought come from, you know, uh, uh, and that scared him so much that he started exploring that, of what could bring a father to murder his own child, and of course, uh, attempts to murder his child, attempts to murder his wife. Um, and that was in many ways the genesis uh, for, uh, for the shining of, of that exploration. And again, this is a real sort of human phenomenon, right? I mean, he, fathers kill their children all the time. So the mothers, fathers kill their, their wives and their, their girlfriends. Um, uh, and, and it's a terrifying thing to contemplate of what could drive a person to do that. And, uh, and The Shining is this brilliant exploration of that. And of course, also of alcoholism is another theme that runs throughout, throughout the novel uh, of, of how a character, again, in the novel in particular, a good character, the hero of the story, you're, you know, when you're reading that novel, you are rooting for Jack Torrance. You believe him that he's going to somehow overcome and save his family from the supernatural terrors in the Overlook Hotel. But at the end of the day, the greatest terror 
mirror is Jack Torrance himself. It is the it is the the the, the, the monster inside of us that ultimately ends up being our, our own destruction. Um, and yes, uh, I'm, I'm noticing the typo now here. Thank you for catching that, Jim. It's the shinning, uh, not the shining, uh, uh, in, in true Simpsons fashion. Uh, but alas. Um, and then lastly, uh, again, I think basically every single film by David Cronenberg. Uh, Cronenberg, again, is a pioneer, master of the genre of body horror, uh, of this idea of our own body sort of turning against ourselves and, and transmorphing into something alien, something that attacks us. Uh, you know, again, there's there's metaphors for cancer that run through Cronenberg's work all over the place. Uh, you know, uh, 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 films like you know, uh, 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 The Fly would be an example um, uh, of how it is the, the, the how uncomfortable it is to be trapped in a body, a body that you don't always control, a body that ends up turning against you and doing things. Anyone who's ever suffered from disability, for example, right? Someone who's, who, who's been temporarily and permanently paralyzed of how what was once under their control, but how their body would obey their orders now refuses those orders uh, and how we are turned into something which is fundamentally alien to us. Um, and of course, then there's just the, the grossness, right, of having all these bodily fluids, this, this blood and pus and urine and piss uh, 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 and, and semen, right? The, the, this, the, 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 these fluids themselves are in many ways kind of horrifying. Uh, they, they, uh, they're obviously transmissions for diseases, which brings us back again sort of to this evolutionary side of things, the, 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 the sort of natural repulsion and revulsion to, 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 to bodily fluids uh, because they're scary, because they can transmit diseases. And Cronenberg, I think, taps into very much that primitive sense of how our bodies itself, much less the bodies of other people, can be horrifying to us. Um, uh, and it, this is something which is uh, something which, again, it, it's uh, Cronenberg isn't for everybody. Um, but I think, again, at his best, uh, he, he makes you recognize and attend to, to the, 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 the horrors inside your own body perhaps better than any other filmmaker that I know. Uh, okay, again, not an exhaustive list, but uh, once again, sort of pause to see if you guys have any sort of thoughts or reflections either on, again, on body horror, on, on the devil inside of all of us, uh, on, on the nature of human corruption and human moral failings and how horror can reflect these things to us. Well, I wanted to pick up on something you said um, during the, the, before you talked about your examples. You said um, perhaps bad horror films are ones that don't allow us to distance ourselves from the evil inside of us. Is that, am I summarizing what you said? Uh, no, no, that's backwards. It's, it's bad horror films reinforce this idea that the monsters are all out there, uh, that, that, you know, that they are the monsters. The monster is an inhuman force that's going to attack us. Right, they don't allow us to distance. I, I double negative to you, um, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, is that like can you can you talk about that a little bit more about how a quality how the quality of the film you know one star two star three star five star uh relates to that more am i or am i just like putting you on the spot too much no no i can sort of speak to that i mean i certainly don't want to say it's the only metric for a film or it's the only measure of film obviously there's many different ways in which you can you can assess a film film qua film or film or horror film um, but in this respect, again, uh, a film like Friday the 13th, for example, again, the original Friday the 13th, you know, again, is, is about a mother who, who goes on a murder spree. Um, but, uh, all the subsequent ones where, where Jason becomes the killer, um, uh, he, he, even though he's sort of nominally human, he, especially as the, as the series progresses, he becomes less and less human, more and more just this unthinking, unfeeling monster in the shadows. Um, and, and that sort of story, uh, again, where, you know, it, 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 it allows us to sort of treat murderers uh, and, and killers as if they weren't like us. You know, that they are the sort of less than human or subhuman kind of kind of creature. Uh, and I, I, I find that suspect. Um, it's also might be part of the reason why I was, I've never been particularly fond of, uh, uh, of werewolf films, right? Because they, they carry this sort of thing too, that uh, uh, the, 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 the monster uh, in, in the werewolf film is always you know, sort of something that's subhuman. It starts off as a literal wolf, right? And the literal wolf bites the human. And then uh, it's only through that transformation that they become subhuman. Uh, um, and, and that's, again, I, I, I'm kind of skeptical of that, right? I prefer a story in where, where the, the, the monster is inside of you the whole time. 
uh, where, where, the, where it's the human, you know, either literally or metaphorically, uh, the, the, it's the, it's the, it is our human nature that is itself monstrous and terrifying. In some ways, I think you could even cast um, the horror films which externalize the horror as sort of as sort of unhorror films, right? Or ironic sort of horror films, because um, at the same time as they present something that's ostensibly scary and you know intimidating and and something that you know makes our spines tingle, it's also reassuring us that that it's not us. It's it's out there. It's out there, and it's you know, and it's actually a vampire, and vampires aren't real anyway, and so you don't have anything to worry about. It's not us. It's out there. It's them. It's the other, and and certainly I think that there are kind of you could kind of bifurcate horror films into horror films that are about fear of the other versus fear of the self, you know, um, and and I think that almost all of the all of the uh, films that you're sort of castigating for for an unsophisticated look at horror are probably probably fall into the former category that they're sort of uh, horror movies about fear of the other rather than about fear of the self. Um, but, but I do think it is interesting to, to, to contemplate the idea that, that, you know, maybe these horror movies that are, you know, horror by genre or by trope, but that are actually saying to us that the evil is far away from us, that, that it's not part of us and that perhaps we can overcome it, or at least that it is so alien to us that it, we will recognize it as alien when it's in our midst, um, is sort of an unhorror movie in in kind of a in in kind of a honestly profound way, you know, where it's saying the problem isn't here. The problem is something that that is completely outside of you that you don't have any input into. Yeah, I mean, I'm I guess I'm having a little bit of trouble relating unhorror to uh, a quality of film. I mean, Alien technically would be, in that case, an unhorror film because it is fear of the other, um, at least for the majority of it after uh, after the the botched pregnancy. Um, and, and I I I think that there are also like I didn't see the Belco experiment, but that's certainly a film that, um, by its trailer, is about how human beings are are awful. Well, Saw I saw Saw. Um, that's a that's a film about how human beings are generally just awful people. The the uh, yeah, I guess it would be an unhorror film, um, and that is uh, I. I thought the twist was cool, but aside from that, it was it was sort of a mediocre film. So I guess the the relationship between um, quality and uh, where the horror comes from is not that's not something I'm totally jumping on board with. Um, I the, you know the, we're we're adults; we can disagree, but that's that's sort of where I. I I I stumbled as I was listening to what you were saying, Garrett. Um, yeah, well, I mean, this this wasn't meant to be like a grand unified theory of all things that are quality and horror. Like I say, this is but but one element, but one dimension. Even if it, even if a film fails on this one dimension, it might succeed in several others. Um, on the topic of Alien itself, again, I'm, I'm remembering what Stephen King said about Alien. He he viewed it fundamentally as. Uh, a, a Lovecraftian horror rather than than science fiction horror, uh, but instead of you know the elder gods coming to us, it's we we went to the elder gods um, and, and found something incomprehensible and horrifying. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about Lovecraft uh, uh, in a second here, uh, going going forward, um, and that will some way sort of come back to it. Um, but I think again, even in something like uh, uh, like Alien, um, it, it, they're they're I mean, by its very nature, again, it's, it's unhuman, right? It's. Uh, uh, I, I also have not seen the Belko experiment, uh, but I have seen um, the the Japanese film. Oh crap! What's it called? Uh, that Belko experiment was based on. Um, uh, gosh, does anyone know what I'm talking about here? Um, I can look it up. Uh, yeah, but anyway, it's it's uh, uh, Battle Royale. Battle Royale. That's the film, um, and it's it's a similar sort of premise. Um, and also has certain similarities to Saw. Uh, and I actually thought, I, I thought the first Saw film actually was quite good. Uh, I, the second Saw film I thought was absolutely terrible and I didn't see any of the other ones after that. But I do think again, it, it, that, that, that the progression in Saw tracks what I'm talking about. You know, in, 
in, in, in the first film, there is something very, very human about it. Um, and it, you know, from and, and that humanity, I think, was very much lost in the second film. And from what I can gather from the subsequent films, again, it, bec it became camp, right? It became kind of this sort of the, the, this set of cliches, uh, and, and precisely less human because of that. Well, I think um, it became stupid. Like it became ridiculous. It, it became ridiculously impossible that the uh, the uh, jigsaw, the guy behind jigsaw, whatever his real name is, um, that he could have set up so much bullshit to happen. It, it became where you couldn't willfully suspend your disbelief because it was just, it, it, it was dumb. Um, and and I, I guess I think of a film like Compliance, like that's a good film about how the horror is within. Um, so I guess that does track what you're saying. Um, and I think, think of a film like, let me see if I can find a good one, because I was thinking of It Follows, in which there is a, a relentless other character who's just pursuing you. Um, once again, that that's, I hated that film. I know no and I will disagree forever on that. He'll probably hate maybe, me maybe after he watches hunt, it. Example. The Hunt, yeah, oh. okay. The Hunt is, yeah, that would be because a good the example. Hunt, the, the, the monsters are us. But it's also the other. It's society is the mon is the monster, and we're individ individually we're the victim. So um, I, I can sort of throw in here. I think uh, even though I have not watched the most re most recent, I think two seasons. I think The Walking Dead for at least for for a while did a fantastic job of exploring what I'm talking about here. Nominally, it's a story about zombies, right? And zombies again are inhuman. And you know, a, a, a bad zombie story isn't very interesting, but what made The Walking Dead, and again, it, it owes debts here to The Night of the Living Dead, as all zombie stories do, what, what, what made that great was, uh, as the tagline for The Walking Dead says, it says, fight the dead, fear the living. It's really about how human beings in the collapse of society can't trust one another, and we, we form uh, groups, we form you know, cliques that we bond together to fight, and then we end up fighting other uh, 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 other cliques in this way, other groups of humans. So what, what, what's really scary isn't so much the zombies. That's sort of just the, the, the background effect, uh, the, the catalyst, as it were. Uh, what's really scary is precisely how much you can't trust other human beings. Well, it's uh, Lord of the Flies. Yeah, Lord of the Flies, exactly. I mean, it's, it's Thomas Hobbes is what it is. It's all Thomas Hobbes about how you know uh, human beings are fundamentally selfish egoists and, uh, and, and life in a state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Um, so uh, 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 in that respect, again, I think uh, 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 you can see Walking Dead and, again, good zombie films as uh, explicitly sort of playing off this kind of uh, um, uh, uh, duality that I'm talking about. But like I say, Jim, yeah, obviously there's going to be counterexamples. It's not going to cover every single film. Uh, Alien, you know, it would be a good example of a film which perhaps doesn't fit this uh, fit this this mode terribly well. Damn it, uh, yeah, I wanted your unified, unified theory. theory. <laughs> um, I do want to speak to a question that we have from, from the audience, though, of, about serial killers, about why serial killers are sort of romanticized in both reality and in film. Um, uh, obviously, the film which comes to mind here is Natural Born Killers, which Oliver Stone made as a film uh, precisely because he wanted to, to sort of do a meditation on how the media sensationalizes serial killers. I remember that Stephen King said that growing up, he had a fascination with serial killers. He studied them, and people worried about him as a kid for, uh, for that reason precisely. Um, so yeah, I think that the, the audience member here is actually sort of speaking to, to a very clear sort of uh, sociological phenomenon about uh, about serial killers. Uh, I can't say necessarily have a sort of a, 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 a lot of insight to shed on that particular idea. Off the top of my head, what I think about is there, there is something kind of romantic about serial killers precisely because uh, uh, they, they, they transgress um, sort of the, the, the social norms. They, they, they violate, they do the things that we're told we're not supposed to do, but it, by the very nature of a serial killer, they have to get away with it for at least a short while. Uh, you know, if they don't, they're a spree killer. If they just kill 20, 30 people, uh, you know, they're, not, they're a spree killer, not a serial killer. A serial killer has to be able to transgress these boundaries, but also somehow get away with it. Um, and that there's some, perhaps there's something in uh, all of us that want to be able to do that, not necessarily to kill people, uh, but, but we do want to exercise our ego, right? We, we do want to do the things that we we're told that we're not supposed to do without having to pay the consequences and to be able to get away with it. Perhaps it's the same reason why we, we sort of fetishize gangster films for, 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 for somewhat of the same reason, perhaps. Um, but all, 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 all they are, they're also, uh, they also satisfy 
all of the conceptions of evil as outside of us that that we want in horror films. I mean, Jason and Freddy, well, not Freddy, Jason and Michael Myers are forms of serial killers. So they work in horror films as the villain, because I think we use the term psychopath in the same way that we use the term evil to dehumanize, to uh, to to cut down the humanity of another person. And I think serial killers so often appear in films because they're they're capable of satisfying the generic conventions of an an otherized evil. And what is more, you because they are human, we are able to imbue them with the type of intelligence that would then make our hero have a battle of wits with them. So I'm thinking of Seven, where um, the the John Doe character is seen as a psychopath, is seen as evil, is seen as, as crazy, is seen as otherized and dehumanized, but he is also human enough to be smart enough so that he uh, he 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 provides a uh, a, a witting ma a, a match of wits uh, with Morgan Freeman, uh, particularly in that film. Um, so as to why we do that as a society, I think it does go to some of the things you were talking about earlier, Garrett, about how we have this tendency to otherize or externalize that which is evil. Um, I don't know if I interrupted you, Antonio, but if I did, I'm sorry, and I'm done now. <laughs> no, all good, all good. So uh, something else, what uh, Jim, which I was thinking of as, as you made that comment, um, uh, we, you know, with regard to sort of uh, serial killers uh, as, as a genre, there's, there's some movies where you sort of root for the killer, right? And again, you know, so Friday the 13th would probably be an example of this, right? You know, the, sort of the, the standard trope is even though the, nominally Jason is the villain, uh, people go because they want to see Jason kill people. They want to see him kill in creative ways. Um, and so, you know, something similar about Saul, right? There's the creativity behind the deaths that is particularly sort of attractive. Um, and, you know, to my mind, that's, you know, maybe a notch above a jump scare, right? A jump scare is kind of, is, is, is a cheap sort of a, um, a, a way of getting an emotional reaction from the audience, but precisely because it's primitive and automatic, uh, uh, that it doesn't take a whole lot of artistry to sort of evoke it. And, and so when you have a film where you are sort of rooting for, the, the bad guy, right? Where you're rooting for, for the, the, the killer uh, to, to, to kill as many people as possible or something like that. I, I, it suggests to me, again, it's a hint that uh, something sort of important about uh, a function that horror does when it does as well as being lost. Uh, it's easy and cheap to come in and root for high body count or root for creative killing. It's not that that, that, that can't be enjoyable. It certainly can. Um, but the... Again, I think the, the better films in, in the horror genre are the ones where you you know you may feel the temptation perhaps to, to to root for the bad guy, but you 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 never ever sort of fully come over to their side. You 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 remain uh, uh, convinced that they are terrible. An interesting sort of uh, possible uh, you know exception or maybe boundary crosser on this one is. Uh, the, the Silence of the Lambs, you know, the Hannibal Lecter series of novels, right? You know, in, in The Silence of the Lambs, Lecter is already caught, you know, I mean, he's, he's behind bars in both Red Dragon and uh, Silence of the Lambs. Uh, so it, you can sort of root for him a little bit because he's sort of been defanged, you know, he's no longer a threat. Um, but, you know, in the final film, Hannibal, right, when he actually is released and he gets out there into the world, uh, it sort of becomes harder. And then, of course, there was the whole sort of controversy about the final film uh, and about why Jodie Foster didn't reprise the role as Clarice Starling because she didn't like the way the film ended. Uh, and again, it, it sort of is playing in on precisely what we're talking about here, right, about whether you can root for the bad guy, whether you can want Hannibal Lecter to escape to get away with it or not, um, and whether or not that somehow sort of cheapens the, the psychological force of the, of the, of the trilogy uh, for that reason. Um, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll check and make sure that anyone else, if anyone else has anything to say on this and we've got sort of Jungian themes perhaps or anything like that before moving on. All right, okay, I'll take that as a, as a, a sign that we're, we're ready to, 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 to continue. Uh, okay, so, so next up, I want to sort of shift from uh, sort of, again, sort of moral themes and more into sort of uh, to, to aesthetic themes. Uh, and in particular, I want to talk about sort of the, the, the flavor of, of art, both sort of literary and uh, fine art, uh, known as the grotesque. 
Uh, so starting off here with a quote from St. Augustine, what pleasure can there be in the sight of a mangled corpse which can only horrify? Uh, now, Augustine, of course, is, is a man who, who doubtlessly saw many corpses you know, he, you know, he, in his life. This is, this is not a, a, an academic or an imagined thing. And, of course, he never saw a mangled corpse in film or something like that. He only saw the real thing. Um, and if, when that is sort of your only exposure to it, uh, I, again, I don't fault Augustine for sort of having this perspective. Uh, but at the same time, I do think there's sort of a failure of imagination going on with Augustine here, because I do think that death actually can be you know, presented in a way uh, where it actually can be sort of fundamentally beautiful, not in the moral sense, not in the sense of where it's sort of a good thing, but it, it just in an aesthetic sense, where, where, where somehow the, the, the visual image and the way it's portrayed sort of strikes us and grabs us. Uh, I know one of those like sort of top 10 listicle sort of videos on YouTube cited here, um, uh, the, the, the pool scene in Let Me In as an excellent example of, of a beautifully portrayed death sequence. Uh, and it definitely is, uh, it's a wonderful film. The original Let Me In, that is. The, uh, uh, um, uh, but it's, it, it is an astonishing scene. It's worth checking out. And it is sort of just an incredibly well composed as a piece of cinema. Uh, but my examples here are going to be more sort of static rather than visual than, than, than video. Uh, so here we have uh, Peter Paul Rubens, uh, uh, his, his a painting of Saturn devouring his son. Um, which, again, to, to me, me again, the, the horror elements of this painting are just astounding. I mean, again, the, the, the look on the child's face and the look on Saturn's face, uh, you know, this, this, is, this is pure horror, but it's doubtlessly fine art. You know, uh, uh, no one, I think, would deny that, that, that Peter Paul Rubens uh, uh, is, 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 is making art here, uh, but he's doing something which is sort of fundamentally horrific um, and you know, taps in some ways to what we're talking about in The Shining, right, about, about a father killing his own son. Uh, here's another uh, portrayal of the exact same theme. Uh, this is uh, uh, Goya's uh, uh, Saturn devouring his son. Uh, and what I love about sort of putting these two things side by side, even though sort of they, they're, they're nominally painting the same, same themes, is these sort of the, the emotional reactions. While both horrific are sort of fundamentally different. When you look at the expression on Goya's Saturn and compare it with uh, Rubens' Saturn, uh, they, they, they seem to be feeling very different things, even though they're both engaged in this horrific act. And then, of course, Goya's uh, uh, Saturn, the boy has no face, no head that's, that's already been devoured, so there's no sort of emotional reaction there. Um, uh, and, and so the, 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 I don't think anyone is going to contest that both of these images are fine art, but they clearly fall under the, the heading of the grotesque. Um, another example here, of course, comes uh, from the Garden of Earthly Delights, uh, the, 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 the triptych by, um, uh, uh, oh, crap, I'm blanking. What's the artist's name? Someone help me here. Um, uh, uh, Bosch, yeah, Hieronymus Bosch, yeah. Uh, it's, this is his depiction of hell. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's much been sort of serialized and even satirized and explored. Uh, again, the, 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 there's, there's a lot here to, to be examined. There's this sort of incredible phantasmagoria uh, of, of uh, this nightmarish depiction of hell. Uh, but at the same time, again, it's, it's visually stunning and visually captivating. Uh, so while it is sort of horrific and disgusting at the same time, it's also beautiful and also enrapturing. Uh, I don't know the artist for these next two pictures. I wish I did so I could give them proper credit, but uh, I, I, I do think that they're excellent examples here of, of precisely what I'm talking about. Here you, you, you have this incredible sort of array of monstrous creatures, but are sort of, that are nonetheless sort of have these sort of human qualities to them. And precisely what sort of makes this both beautiful and horrifying is how it blends together the alien and the human, uh, how it exaggerates certain alien qualities. Uh, again, the, the figure over here on the right, you know, sort of the, with, with the breasts and the clear sort of sexuality. And then again, we have the sort of vagina dentata head uh, uh, going up there. Um, uh, and so again, I, I find this, this work to be incredibly striking. Like I said, I wish I knew, I knew the artist. Uh, I probably figured out if I did a Google image search, but I didn't quite have time. Um, then another one uh, image here again, also black and white, also sort of like another phantasmagoria, uh, a depiction presumably of hell or something like it, uh, where you have this sort of just this array of monstrous creatures which don't fit any rhyme or reason you know there's no sort of species here there's no sort of recurring examples of the same kind of thing that might give you a sense of purchase where you you can understand the type of beings that are in this hell every single individual monster is unique everyone is different and everyone is sort of horrific um, uh, but it's also again still I think very clearly a wonderful control of, co of color of the, of the light and the dark the shadow um, it's not quite chiaroscuro I don't think but it's you know it, it's still just I think a fantastic depiction of a beautiful but horrifying scene um, so, so these are some examples from 
fine art, but I, I want to give here now, uh, from, from going back sort of to the cinema or to television, if you will, some, some pictures uh, from Brian Fuller's uh, version of Hannibal to go back again to, to, to Hannibal Lecter. Um, I think one of the things that makes Hannibal such a phenomenal show, and one of the things which surprised the, the hell out of me when I saw it, was how re remarkable Fuller and his team of people were able to sort of create these incredibly intricate and beautiful depictions of, of dead corpses. It requires, again, a certain amount of suspension of disbelief. You know, there's so there's so many different you know, uh, flamboyant serial killers who stage their victims in this way, it's, and they all happen to be within like the Washington D.C. Baltimore area. So it's a little bit implausible in that respect. But uh, you know, the, the the depictions are so again, to, to my mind, just strikingly beautiful. And 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 uh, you know, they're, they they have these, this this image here of the eye of all these sort of corpses, uh, uh, creating an image of an iris. Uh, which is really just sort of sort of astounding. It's this, 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 you know, it's there's so many remarkable, beautiful images uh, in this show, um, but that are nonetheless, you know, they're beautiful through the use of a, a human corpse in some way. Um, and these are just three examples, really. There's so many. I mean, almost every single episode of the show has some example of uh, you know, a, a a human corpse presented in a way that is simultaneously horrifying, but also really, really beautiful. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a series I recommend highly for that reason. And, and Brian Fuller's visual, static visual style is really, really fantastic. If you compare uh, his show before Hannibal, Pushing Daisies, which also has some, something of a morbid death fascination about it, but, but it's done in a way that's in no way grotesque. It's, that, that, that's done in just this sort of beautiful, playful, childish kind of fantastic color world to see Fuller go from that, fr from Pushing Daisies, uh, which had this sort of fantastical fantasy element to the dark, to horrific depictions of Hannibal, uh, uh, but still having this this, this re recognizable visual aesthetic cut across those uh, is something that's I think, in incredibly rewarding. And again, it puts I think the lie to uh, saying that saying Augustine quote that I had, uh, where in which there's the the, the human body, the, the corpse can do nothing but revolt. Uh, it can do that, but it can also be beautiful. And the amazing things that can do these two things basically at the exact same time. Uh, okay, so then that's that, that's that's all I have to say on that. I'll, again, I'll hand it over to you guys again if you want to sort of if, if you can think of any examples of your own or, or if you want to expand on anything that I've talked about. No, I've dumbfounded you on this one. Okay, so uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm just sitting here being a little revolted at the same time that I'm a little awed by some of these images. I mean, I I didn't watch Hanno I didn't watch the show, so. Um, this is the first time I'm seeing some of this and I'm also checking at one point I was checking to see if the the guy still had his liver and if it was on the right side. Um, but, uh, <laughs> as, as necessary. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. This is, yes, it's striking, but is it striking in its beauty or is it striking in its inhumanness and in its revoltingness I think I, like I'm I'm having a little bit of once again I'm having a little bit of cognitive dissonance with this I'm sort of working that out uh, live on YouTube so I'm glad you all were here to see that uh, I, I don't know because I think uh, you know I come from a for those who don't know I come from a background where I was a paramedic for um, two years and so when I say that I saw my fair share of corpses it's not a creepy thing it's it it was part of my job and I could not like the St. Augustine quote applies to me the human corpse can do nothing except revolt and even when I see something like the images that you've shown on my computer screen which please take them down soon um I I I I have some, well, you didn't have to, but thanks. Um, uh, I, I, I think there's a perverseness in making beauty out of the human corpse and out of death. And uh, maybe that's my own kind of thing that's, that's, that's in my own psychology, but I, I I don't know. I found those. I found those uh, those images more perverse than I found them beautiful. So I th I think I can address this. Um, you're familiar with the bodies exhibit, the work of Gunther von Hagens, right? Yes, I am. Yeah, I'm actually a body donor for the Institute for Plastination. 
um, okay. because I find that so beautiful and so striking. And there's something that I can get into another time, Garrett. But while I'm, that's what I want done with my body. I could um, easily be a body donor for medical school or just even be put on a corpse farm. I want something done with, and this is a, I, I won't get into it in this hangout, but there's something I don't, just being buried or cremated is so like, I'll say gentle. I want something done with my body that, that that's kind of violent and uh, grotesque. And I can get into why another time, but I find those kind of peaceful in, in their uh, explosive, uh, grotesqueness. It's very complicated. Uh, and I need to like think out better about how I want to say this, but I was just thinking that, I, you know, a night at the museum bodies exhibit would be a great, um, you know, a great, a great movie. A great that mashup movie. Ben Stiller stars in the night at the museum bodies exhibit where the, uh, plasticized <laughs> bodies come, uh, come alive um yeah, right. yeah i would love that no and, and there was the one in the horse and everything anyway i just i think that there is beauty in um depending on how it's done i mean some of this is just meant to gross out um like the one that's on the current on the screen now it's meant to horrify it's 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 good art but it's not beautiful but because it's inhuman and uh plastination those exhibits are so human it's it's undeniable and uh it's it's kind of shocking to to reveal that humanity through the art and i guess that's what i like about the the gore in and even even in dumb movies like uh final destination where it's just exaggerated um almost sarcastic in its portrayal of death it uh there there's a satisfaction for me that i get out of seeing um i don't know if i'm making any sense well i I'm, i just think i i think perhaps you and i sort of i first of all anything that anybody chooses to do with their body after they die is is completely their business and and you know, I completely support your right and your your um, choice in 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 choosing to do that. Um, based upon my experience, death has been nothing but monstrous. It's been nothing. It's death has been nothing except the thing that I went to work every day uh, for two years to fight against. It was a coworker that I really didn't like, um, and that was. And, and that makes me, I, I find some of those plasticization exhibits to be um, somewhat exploitative uh, at the same time that I find, although I also recognize the fact that they have incredible educational value and I think that, you know, it, it's, they should, they should exist as an educational tool. I just don't find them an objet d'art, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I, I, maybe I'm sort of betraying my own personal point of view rather than uh, coming up with some sort of objective aesthetic criteria for horror film and, and for um, the horror genre. I will say that there are striking, they, the images that you had on my screen uh, previously are incredibly striking. They're well composed. Um, I don't know if I can apply the adjective beauty to it, beautiful to it. So, I well, I mean, again, I think the, the important thing to recognize here again is, is that there, in all of these, there are an element of fantasy. You know, it, it's, it is not realism. You know, there, there, there's very little in uh, Fuller's Hannibal uh, that you would sort of characterize as, as, as realistic. I can say it requires a certain sort of suspension of disbelief. Um, and yeah, so if you're, if you're, if you're, what, what you demand from art is, you know, pure realism, then this, there's going to be sort of a transgression there. But if, if you, going back to what I said before about using sort of fiction as a mirror to, to see Medusa so you don't turn to stone, uh, 
um, uh, uh, the the presentations here uh, are, are are transgressive. I think it's deliberately so. Um, um, did you use the word perverse? Is that the word, that you, Jim? I can't remember exactly. What yes, I did. Yeah. I, yeah. So, so th there, there is sort of supposed to be a perversion here. Um, uh, it, it is supposed to sort of to give you this sort of uh, th this cognitive dissonance, where on the one hand it is horrific, it is disgusting, it's horrifying, but at the same time there also is something like you say, it's a beautiful composition, the color, the light, all that stuff. Uh, you know, it, it presents in this way. Uh, you know, I imagine, although I don't know for sure because I'm not an art historian, I imagine that when uh, Rubens's painting and when Goya's painting were first unveiled, unveiled that people had the same sort of reaction. You know, that, that, that people said, you know, that this is that, that this is disgusting, this is repulsive, this isn't art. Um, uh, but you know, Rubens and, and Goya have st stood the test of time in that regard, and uh, you know, the, the, they're recognized today as being, you know, sort of a, a depiction of something that is nominally horrific. Actually, why don't I back up for, to that when I'm at it? Uh, um, uh, uh, so th th there is something here which is, you know, it's supposed to turn you off. It is grotesque. Again, the genre is called grotesque for a reason. Um, but it touches something in us. You know, it, 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 like uh, Cronenberg's body horror, it draws our attention to our corporeality, uh, towards, towards our own flesh, uh, towards you know, something sort of monstrous about just sort of you know, the, the act of eating itself. Um, uh, and it, 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 by sort of touching on this, it, it can, makes us aware of something that is profoundly human, the, to go back to that earlier theme. So I just want to be clear before I go that I didn't say that they were not art. I said that they weren't beautiful. Like, I, I just want to be clear. Like, all of this is art. Um, so just, just to be clear there. Uh, go ahead, Jonah. I'm sorry. How would you respond then to the art of uh, Alex Gray? Um, I believe he's the guy who did the cover work for the Tool albums. Am I right? I think so. I just posted an image of just in, in the chat um, just so you can see. Uh, I can't really pull it up for the for the for the viewers, but yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that, I, that he's the guy who did the the, the cover art for uh, for for several Tool albums. Um, and as and, and yeah, as I recall, I think they're they're, they're quite gorgeous. They're sort of psychedelic, right? And they have this sort of the third eye. Yeah, and look, he he does anatomical art, but it's also very I don't want to say spiritual, but I don't know what another word I'd use is because he halos everyone in light, and there's kind of like the radiating. This is going to sound really like hokey, but it's it's like the radiating energy. Right. Um, yeah. Um, so. uh, okay. But anyway, so uh, um, I want to move on from here. I think I, you know, more, more could be said, but I'm looking at the clock. I wanted to make sure we keep within sort of a two hour time limit here. Um, so uh, I want to sort of try to sort of look towards wrapping up by, by, by taking a step back, by looking at this, the, kind of the context of death and, and, and how um, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of the awareness that, uh, you know, when you look at a corpse, that that's the inevitable fate for all of us. Um, and that brings us to sort of this, this broader theme of, of, of existential horror. Um, I think they had the, the, the best definition of existential horror, some random person on the internet, I don't know who defined existential horror as the idea that you are going crazy, but the monsters are still real. Uh, I thought that was an incredibly punchy and, uh, uh, uh apt way of talking about the, 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 the nature of existential horror. Um, and I'll sort of, give, sort of give an example here of, of, of Richard Matheson's novel, I Am Legend, which has been made into a film many times, but never well, which is a real shame because the novel is quite astounding. Um, it goes back again to this, uh, the, the theme we were talking about before, about how uh, there's, there's monsters inside of all of us. So for those of you unfamiliar with the novel, it's about a vampire apocalypse. Vampires have taken over the world. Our hero is the last remaining human being, and he goes out during the day to try to stake as many vampires as he can, and then holes up in his uh, his castle at night to fortify himself from the onslaughts. Uh, and then the and at the end of the, the novel, what make, the, the, the twist, the realization is that he is now the monster. The, the vampires are the rightful inheritors of the earth, and he is the one who's going out and killing them which evokes this, this famous quote from Friedrich Nietzsche, whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster. And if you gaze long enough into the abyss, the abyss will also gaze into you. Um, and so the, the, again, the, 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 the relationship here, but again, uh, sort of somewhat repeating myself here, but again, I think it's, it's an important theme uh, of how it is that you know, who, someone who is sort of nominally good, someone who's who seems to be seemingly doing the right thing and seemingly is morally justified, uh, without realizing it, actually becomes the very thing uh, that they hate uh, and becomes the, the the thing that they were trying to destroy, um, and in the process destroys themselves. 
uh, uh, this is something I think which is a sort of you know, a horrifying prospect to anyone who wants to fight the good fight. Anyone who, whether that be again a police officer who's who's uh, uh, investigating serial killers or murderers, uh, or, or whether that be a political activist who is trying to fight back against evil and corruption in politics uh, and ends up sort of accumulating the power that's necessary to, to actually fight that fight, uh, and in the process of accumulating that power themselves becomes corrupted by it. Uh, there's, of course, the classic story of Dr. Faustus, you know, the, the, the standard sort of overreacher story, right, of the, the person who, who, who shoots too far uh, and, re and wants too much and ends up being destroyed by it. Um, and, you know, and, and, and again, the, the horror in Dr. Faustus, of course, is precisely that Faustus gets everything that he could ever hope for. He gets power over death itself, power over the cosmos, uh, and he's consumed by it. Uh, and, and again, in the process of... of, of of, of chasing after uh, this this knowledge, this this power, uh, uh, he ends up losing his very humanity. And of course, there's many different versions of the Dr. Faustus myth, um, and they have different sort of morals and different highlights, but I think all of them sort of share this idea uh, that, that achieving uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the forbidden knowledge of, of, of wrapping your head around the mystery of the universe and existence itself uh, uh, is itself a process that would destroy you. Uh, and how horrific and 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 terrible uh, that that result can end up being. Uh, then, of course, this leads us to to H.P. Lovecraft, uh, uh, who again I alluded to before. Uh, you know, the Lovecraftian horror, cosmic horror, uh, is this sort of this this terrifying idea that ultimately that human beings are just fundamentally insignificant, uh, that the universe is so far beyond us. Uh, that nothing we can do, and all, with all our science and all our philosophy and all our rationalism, that the universe ultimately is cosmically sort of indifferent to us, uh, and that the, the elder gods will someday wake and crush us uh, and destroy us all. It will be as if none of us has ever existed, and our existence amounts to nothing. Uh, all, all our love, all our fear, all those emotions, everything we invest ourselves in, which seems so important to us uh, in this moment, uh, are ultimately at mean nothing in the face of the universe itself. Uh, so Jim, in some ways, again, is bringing us back to alien and sort of your concern that there's sort of nothing human in the alien, so doesn't that sort of fail my test? Well, in some ways, again, I think what, what, by coming back to Lovecraft, what we see here again is it's going so far in the opposite direction uh, uh, that, it, that it sort of, again, it achieves, it begins it sort of coming full circle and becomes a, 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 a transcendent for that purpose as well. Um, and, you know, it, it's not that human beings are monstrous, it's that human beings simply don't matter uh, and that our existence is trivial and insignificant. And that itself is also horrific. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, again, if, if, if the vastness of space, if the aliens out there are going to conquer and destroy us, if they're going to kill us off and pick us off one by one, and then it'll just be a ghost ship floating in, uh, in the nothingness, the Nostromo going out with, uh, with, with everyone dead upon it, um, that, that can be horrifying for, uh, for precisely this reason that, um, uh, that none of us are there. And then, of course, again, to, 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 to pick up where alien aliens picks up, right, where Ripley makes it back to Earth, but she's been gone for 86 years, and even her own daughter is dead now, and everyone that she loves is dead. Um, uh, and that kind of, uh, that, that disconnection of being uh, out of our own time uh, also sort of, again, plays into this sort of, these, these, these sort of Lovecraftian themes. Um, and then, uh, uh, lastly, I'll close here uh, with the work of Thomas Ligotti, who I think is uh, someone whose work is really unappreciated. Uh, he's a phenomenal writer, um, a genuinely scary writer, who in some ways plays with Lovecraftian themes. Uh, but he, I think he, he deliberately sort of tries to turn Lovecraft on his head um, because the way sort of uh, Lo uh, Ligotti paints it, uh, while the, the universe sort of is, is nominally incomprehensible, I mean, when you first encounter the horror, uh, yes, it seems meaningless and it seems... Uh, that there, that it amounts to nothing, um, but you know, sort of again, the, the sort of the, the the twists in his story, sort of the, when they when they sort of come full circle and you get this sort of uh, the end. Ultimately, the, the, the things are comprehensible, but they're 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 comprehensible in a way which is even more horrifying than their incomprehensibility. Because you know, if, if, if for Lovecraft, you could at least sort of surrender your, to the incomprehensibility of it and say, well, we're never going to understand it, so we can we might as well sort of just kick back and enjoy the ride, and sort of you can get sort of the sort of uh, a positive of nihilism out of Lovecraft, and Ligotti robs that possibility from us. Uh, in his stories, uh, uh, you, you, you do not have the luxury of nihilism. You do not have the luxury of being able to, uh, uh, to surrender to the meaninglessness of the universe. Uh, uh, you, you, you are insignificant. You, you are pointless. Uh, 
um, uh, but you are doomed actually to understand that fact for the entirety of your existence. Uh, and that's where a lot of the horror in Magadi's work uh, comes from. Um, so yeah, like I, I guess we're almost out of sorts for a two, two hour time. I'm technically we're not limited to that, but I want to keep it sort of within, within that time uh, frame. Uh, so, so I'll stop it there though and ask if you guys want to sort of weigh in on, on, on any of these themes at all. Has any of Ligotti's work been uh, made into a film? To my knowledge, no, I don't think he, it has. And again, it, 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 it somewhat makes sense because it, it's not, you know, it's not really a cinematic work. Um, uh, you know, Lovecraft isn't exactly cinematic either, but, uh, you know, John Carpenter's done a good job, I think, with his film, you know, in the, mouth, uh, in the Mouth of Madness was sort of, you know, very much deliberately a... Um, an attempt to, uh, uh, to to try to sort of make a Lovecraftian horror film. Uh, so no, uh, uh, part of it also is Ligotti's work is very much short stories. Uh, that, that what I know of his work is all short stories. Um, so it would you know you could do it possibly for some sort of serialized horror show or something like that perhaps. Um, uh, but I don't I, may, maybe I'm wrong about this. I haven't checked in some time. It's been a while since I've, I've, I've looked into it. But I don't think has ever been any any films, which is why I, I speak to the the, the, the literature. Okay, Luna here's asking a question about who my favorite writer, um, movie, and artist is. Um, uh, so, writer again, Stephen King across the board, no contest. Um, you know, certainly not everything he does is great, but uh, um, I, you know, uh, I, I try to read everything Stephen King publishes. Um, uh, I, I think he's just he's, he's phenomenal. He's uh, his imagination has so much uh, breadth and covers so many different kinds of uh, stories, horror and non-horror. Uh, that that King just takes the cake. Movie, um, I'm not sure if she means uh, movie of uh, and horror movies or movies in general. But, uh, movie, actually, favorite movie is Shawshank Redemption. No, no coincidence there is a Stephen King story. Uh, but that's not a horror movie. Uh, my favorite horror movie is sort of harder to pinpoint. Alien definitely would be up there. Uh, Rosemary's Baby, uh, which we mentioned before, uh, would make the short list. Seven, which is what we also talked about, is is, is a great film. Um, artist, um, uh, that one's also sort of a tricky one. Um, uh, uh, but I, if I again, if, if I had to had to say, pick a specific one, it'd probably be Dali, um, Salvador Dali, uh, my favorite visual artist. Um, but a bit of a digression there. Um, so again, I'll, 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 if you guys don't have anything else to add, I'll, I'll move on. Um, okay. So to 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 our closer. Um, so the the the, uh, the 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 final the coup de gras, if you will. Um, uh, the the theme of death, of course, has has touched on. Uh, almost everything we've been talking about, almost every single story we've been talking about involves death uh, in some way. And of course, it, it makes sense that death is, is, is one of these constant themes precisely because death is the great unknown, right? Uh, you know, who knows what dreams may come when we shuffle loose this mortal coil uh, to, 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 to butcher somewhat, I think a Shakespeare quote. Um, it's uh, it is you know, the, the horror of death and the fear of death is something uh, which is again, primal and, 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 and comes back to us again and again and again. Um, in his, his masterful work, Dance Macabre, Stephen King says that horror is a rehearsal for death, uh, that by reading about death, we can sort of use this as a way of coming to terms with our own mortality in a way that's incredibly challenging uh, in sort of typical day-to-day uh, uh, -day life. We so much like to engage in the denial of death, to pretend that we're never gonna die, to shove it out of our minds, uh, and horror kind of forces us, or when it's done perhaps better, maybe invites us to, uh, uh, to, to, to face that fear head on and to try to sort of reflect on the nature of, uh, of our own death. Um, and so, so horror fiction allows us to expose ourselves to death in a controlled way. We can come to it on our own terms when we're ready for it, when we're emotionally strong enough and stable enough uh, to, to, to encounter these things and to try to learn the lessons uh, uh, that, that horror fiction has uh, to offer us with regard to our own mortality. Now, of course, most people, uh, at least these days, don't die violent deaths. We're not going to be stabbed by Jason. Uh, we're, we're not going to be uh, 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 die in our sleep because Freddy comes and gets us. So, so obviously, again, there, there's sort of a certain amount of fantasy and fiction that's going on here. So the, 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 the horror in question, the true horror in most horror stories, is just this, this coming to terms with our own mortality. It's recognizing that somehow, some way, one day, all of us are going to die, and probably sooner than any of us would really like to think. Uh, Socrates very famously said that to philosophize is to prepare to die. Uh, and this is th th this phrase, uh, Montaigne takes this as a phrase of one of his essays, to philosophize is prepared to die. And, uh, you know, uh, Montaigne, I think, sort of runs with this really well as a way of sort of saying, again, the, the point of philosophy, as Socrates saw it, was so that when it comes time for our own death, 
we can greet it without fear, without resignation, without regret. Um, as Socrates, again, very famously drank the hemlock, um, he knew that he had, had done his life the way he wanted to, so he wouldn't do it any other way. Um, uh, the, the, the preparation for death is uh, the, 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 jo the, the, the best job of philosophy the, 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 at its highest. Um, it can get lost in sort of academic squabbles and so forth, but really at the end of the day, I do think that Socrates is right here. The point of philosophy is to prepare us for death. Um, and of course, Socrates also famously said, the unexamined life is not worth living, something I actually have tattooed right here on my own flesh, although you can't quite see it very well with this angle of the camera. Um, and so uh, what I want to say is you know, what, what I love about horror fiction is at its best, it allows us to examine our lives. It compels us to examine our lives uh, and forces us to think about the fact that we will die and what we're going to do with ourselves in the meantime, uh, what we're going to do with ourselves uh, before uh, it comes time for us to die, how we're going to live. Um, and that's, I think, an incredibly richly, deeply rewarding thing. Um, it's something that, you know, art at its best, at its finest, does for all of us. Um, uh, and horror at its best can do that perhaps better than, than any other. So that's my, my closer. That's, uh, that's all I have to say. I will hand things over to you guys now uh, if you have any sort of final thoughts on, the, on, on this topic or anything else we've been talking about. Well, just to close on, on the topic of death, um, something that I think maybe doesn't get enough nuance is the difference between death and dying. I think often the fear of death is conflated with the fear of dying. I, I, a lot of folks, I think, aren't necessarily too afraid of being dead, of no longer existing, and are much more intimidated by the notion of knowing that you're flickering out, that, or, or of seeing it coming, or of the suffering that attends the process of dying in many cases. Um, and so I, I think it, it may be not so much that horror is rehearsal for death, so much as that horror, horror is rehearsal for dying, um, to be more accurate. I think that's a fair distinction. Um, yeah, and I, 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 like, I like that distinction because I think that a lot of films, a lot of the good horror films um, talk more about dying than they do talk about death because it seems like when a character dies, unless there's a supernatural element, well, that's just the end of that character's arc. Um, and so I, I, I like that distinction, Antonio. I will also add, I think your final uh, thought, your final uh, closer, Garrett, at the end of this uh, at the end of this slide, that's that's the best that I've seen as a relationship between the philosophy of a film and its quality. Horror at its best allows us to examine our life. I think that's like when I think about bad horror films, they're ones that don't allow me to examine anything because they're they're too simplistic. So I, I, I like that as a I think that works really well as a closer and 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 that's that's sort of where I go where where we talk about quality. So and of course now, uh, in, in the interest of horror, I'm horrifically embarrassed that I misplaced the apostrophe there in that final sentence, but whatever. Um, <laughs> typo number two. Typo number two, typo number two, right. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, Antonio, I certainly want to uh, uh, recognize your distinction, and, and it's a standard distinction from like in the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross sort of school, school of uh, thanatology, right, about how death and dying are distinct and should be treated as distinct. I think that's that's fair, but I was uh, you know, uh, I, I didn't have the, the the nuance there in my as I was wrapping uh, this up. Um, okay, uh, anyone else want to have any final thoughts? You know, I wasn't going to weigh in very much <laughs> on this show, but I, I have to throw this in here. Um, this isn't a horror film, but for me it was probably one of the most hor horrific films I've ever seen um, in that it's, uh, it's a French film from 2012. It's called Amour, and the story is of an older man whose wife is she's going into dementia and she's not wanting to live anymore, and she when she does have her points of being able to um, 
be aware that she's going through this, she begs her husband to kill her so that she doesn't have to experience the horror of dementia anymore. And eventually he tries to face that issue. And it's, it is truly a horror film for me. I know it's a love story and a drama, but um, it, it's one of those things where we should be able to decide when we go. We shouldn't have to suffer. And if you truly love someone, will you let them suffer? Can you be the one who helps them not suffer? Um, it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things going on in the film. I would like to suggest all of you guys go see it and, and uh, check it out. But um, I know it's not meant to be horror. But for me, it really messed with my head. For weeks, I was thinking about this stuff. I was like, oh my gosh, what do I do? I need to plan for this. What, what yeah, I second... I second that. It's a fantastic film, Amour. What Shira just said reminded me a little bit, and this is relevant, but it's going to sound like I'm going on an irrelevant tangent, is that Seinfeld episode where Kramer watches this movie about a woman who goes into a coma, and he can't finish it because it's so painful for him, and he he makes everyone, uh, Jerry and George and Elaine, promise that if he ever goes into a coma that they'll pull the plug. And then after... He convinces them to do that. He finishes the movie and realizes she comes out of the coma. And so he has to go back and uh, unconvince them. And since I can't see any of your faces right now, because I don't know if you're smiling or just kind of rolling your eyes. Jim and I are smiling. I'm laughing. That's hilarious. Yeah. I, I don't think I actually saw that episode of Seinfeld, but that that definitely does seem relevant. Uh, and 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 sure, what, what that actually makes me remember that one of the films that scared my wife the most actually was the film Still Alice, uh, which is also about dementia, early onset Alzheimer's. Um, and I and I won't spoil it for those who haven't seen it, but suffice to say, any story about a woman dealing with Alzheimer's is going to be quite scary in a lot of ways. Uh, so yeah, not a horror film in the traditional sense, but definitely ke- tapping into to certain fears um, uh, that that I- enable this kind of sort of existential re- uh, reflection um, uh, and and this, this philosophical enterprise of, of preparing ourselves to die. And if you, our viewers want to have the uh, the Alzheimer's trifecta, there's the film Away from Her, which is. Uh, also about it's similar themes to a more and still Alice. So that sounds like a fantastic Saturday for somebody, a more still Alice and away with away from her. Um, enjoy those three and, and, uh, <laughs> you know, make sure you raid the liquor store before you do. I guess I would just make you uh, go along with that uh, country music song that says live like you are dying. Cause <laughs> you'd be like, I need to, do everything I have on my bucket list now, because you never know when this might hit. That's actually fascinating that you say that, though, because I mean, it, well, it brings to my mind you know, again, the, the the sort of old saying about they can live like you'll die tomorrow. But I think that, that in some senses that actually is a mistake, because if you you know if you burn your candle at both ends, it will not last the night. You know, the 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 the, the tricky part about life is making sure that you don't leave all the items on your bucket list as it were, but at the same time, if you cross off every item off your bucket list, then what do you have left, right? You, you, there always has to be something else out there more to reach for, more to aspire for, um, uh, because if, if you exhaust it all, then you might as well just up and die. Well, Garrett, it's really interesting that you say that because you know who Larry Walters is? The um, He was the first guy to the, the um, lawn chair pilot who tied a bunch of balloons to his uh, lawn chair and then flew around. Uh, he was the first person to do that. And the band Pinback has a song about him. And the the uh, Rob Crow, the guy who sings the song, says that, well, all right, so let me go back. Um, after Larry Walters did this, he, uh, he became famous for about a year. He went on a book tour, went on all the talk show circuit. And then he, he was a volunteer park worker and he killed himself he shot himself in the woods and uh, so the song is about like why would he do that and his realization is that he had this this was his lifelong dream larry walters to to do what he did and how empty he must have felt there's a line in the song where he says is there nothing left for me to do because like he had fulfilled this dream and he was filled the theory is that he was filled with this uh void and this emptiness that he couldn't fill and so he had to kill himself just because 
he had no sense of purpose. So that just ties in, I think, to um, what you were saying about, you know, not wanting to always needing to have something to work for every day. Yeah, it sounds like an existential horror song. Uh, and it reminds me of another existential horror song. Uh, I think it's Peggy Lee's uh, Is This All There Is, uh, which is a similar sort of reflection on, you know, uh, is this all that there is to life? Uh, how can we f possibly find meaning if, uh, if, if this is all there is, as it were? Um, okay, I think it's probably a, a good place to stop. We're not exactly ending on a, sorry, a horror note, but uh, I think we, we, we've talked amply about that. So hopefully everyone has enjoyed this. Uh, if you have, let us know. If you want to, you would like to see us do more sort of explorations like this, uh, uh, tell us and we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, I don't have the calendar in front of me. Does anyone know what's up next week uh, for the podcast, what the topic is? Yeah, it's uh, Cabin in the Woods next. So... Uh... Go see the new Chris Hemsworth Thor Ragnarok film, and as you're preparing to see Joss Whedon uh, take over Justice League, well, of sorts, take over Justice League, um, see Joss Whedon's fantastic film, Cabin in the Woods, and we will be talking about that, analyzing it to death next week here on the Deadly Analysis Podcast. Yes, another uh, and a great postmodern uh, horror film, which becomes aware of itself and, and plays off its own tropes to defy your expectations, like we were talking about earlier. Uh, okay, thank you all very much. Uh, um, again, leave any comments you have. Uh, like, rate, like, rate, subscribe, as the, the kids say these days. Uh, and we will see you all later. Take care, everybody. <laughs>